Order at 931. How many keep those? Okay. Roll call sees everyone present. Is there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, um, this is the public meeting for planning applications, and I have an obligation to read out this passage. Part of today's council and committee meeting includes statutory public meetings that relate to planning matters. All applications identified in the public meeting section of the agenda today will consist of a public meeting which will be followed by deliberations. Any decision that is made at committee today on these matters need to be ratified by council on Tuesday, April 23rd, 2019. Each public meeting is required to follow the requirements of the Planning Act. In doing so, all members of the public in attendance today will have the opportunity to address the committee, make their views known before a decision is made. The process will be followed. The process that will be followed is staff will provide an overview of the proposal and the recommendations, and the committee may ask questions of staff. <clears throat> I will ask if the proponent wishes to address the committee, the committee may ask them questions. I will ask if anyone wishes to speak for or against the matter. Anyone wishing to speak is to come up to the podium, sign in by printing their name and contact information, make their comments, and the committee may ask questions. Staff may ask for clarification comments. The committee will deliberate on the matter. A decision by council to either approve or refuse a planning proposal can be appealed to a tribunal known as a local planning appeal tribunal on the basis of consistency and or conform conformity with provincial policy and or county official plan policy. In order to ensure your right to participate in any appeal process, you must either make oral submissions at the public meeting today or provide written comments to council before this final decision is made on the matter next Tuesday. Any person wishing to address council next Tuesday, either verbally or in writing, must do so by advising the municipal clerk by 12 p.m. noon, Wednesday, April 17, 2019. If you want to receive a written notice of council's decision on a planning matter, interested members of the public will need to make a written request to the municipal clerk to be notified of the decision. And again, all speakers, please sign in the sheet at the podium. So that brings us, we have one um, planning application. It's on page one, it's PDD-12-219, zoning amendment to permit educational uses at HCCC in partnership with Mohawk College. My understanding is uh, Ashley is gonna give us a overview. So welcome to the podium, Ashley. Thank you. Uh, so good morning, council staff and the public. Uh, Haldeman County staff in conjunction with Mohawk College uh, is requesting uh, a zoning amendment to permit educational and training uses at the Haldeman County Caledonia Center uh, known as HCCC. Uh, so the subject lands are located at 100 Haddington Street, Caledonia, uh, in the center of Caledonia. Uh, the general amendment to permit educational and training uses in general on site applies to the entire subject lands, uh, which is outlined in yellow on the screen before you. Uh, and the Mohawk College is requesting to uh, locate a mobile classroom on site uh, north of the water tower, um, outlined in uh, the red box on the screen before you. Uh, so HCCC contains a number of uses. It's a community hub containing county offices, the library, arena, uh, and different recreational uses. And surrounding land uses are commercial and residential in nature. So last year, Mohawk College uh, approached county staff to offer uh, cost-free post-secondary education uh, to encourage gradual steps uh, towards uh, post-secondary education. Uh, so council did receive a report uh, to overview the offer and approved it. And last uh, summer, uh, Mohawk College offered a pop-up 101 course uh, through the Caledonia Library at the HCCC uh, and an introduction to construction course uh, within their mobile classroom, which was located at the, the Dunville Arena. Uh, so last year, there was no special zoning consideration required uh, because you can have educational uses in the library um, at HCCC. Uh, and uh, D the Dunville Arena doesn't have a scoped uh, zoning, which did allow for um, the mobile trailer to be located on site. 
Uh, and with regards to uh, use of county property, last year uh, the library rental was accomplished via a library rental process at HCCC, uh, and an operational agreement uh, was required to locate the mobile classroom at the Dunville Arena. Uh, so last year, five students completed the program through the Caledonia Library, <coughs> and two students went on to attend further post-secondary education. And eight students registered for the mobile classroom with uh, three completing the program and going on to attend additional post-secondary education. And Mohawk has indicated in their experience it takes a few cohorts <coughs> to uh, gain momentum in new communities. Uh, so Mohawk College has expressed an interest in moving the courses uh, throughout the county. So this year they're looking to um, offer the pop-up 101 course which was offered through the HCCC library at the Dunville library so they'll still be programming through uh, the Dunville library um, and they've uh, they're looking to um, offer an intensive pre-apprenticeship training program um, through the mobile classroom which last year was at the Dunville um, arena they're now looking to put it um, on the HCCC site um, but the existing site-specific zoning at HCCC uh, does not permit uh, educational uses except in the library. So the general amendment is to open up the uses to allow um, <laughs> education and training throughout HCCC on the site and then also allow it in mobile structures such as the mobile classroom. Uh, so the mobile classroom um, will be located again north of the water tower um, in the, uh, the parking area. Uh, uh, so just to clarify, no new development is proposed at this time at uh, HCCC. Um, however, the general amendment will allow educational and training uses in the existing building, on-site, and in temporary mobile structures. Uh, no customized zoning parking is required uh, to have educational and training uses in the existing spaces at HCCC. However, a reduction of up to 10 parking stalls is required to locate uh, mobile trailers on-site, as they will generally take up um, uh, parking spaces. Uh, so planning staff reviewed this against provincial and county policy. Uh, it's our opinion that uh, it is consistent with provincial policy, which encourages a mix and range of uses um, in settlement areas, um, and to co-locate uh, different services, uh, such as schools within community hubs, which HCCC is, uh, and to encourage active transportation between uses. So um, this is located in the middle of Caledonia. It does allow people to walk to the school. Uh, with regards to the official plan, it's designated residential, which does allow community oriented um, uses on site. And the zoning amendment will, uh, will broaden the uses and implement the OP policies, which do permit educational and training uses on site. Uh, so the uh, location of the mobile trailer was, uh, was vetted through the manager of facilities as well as the library CEO. Um, to make sure that the location does not interfere with existing operations at HCCC, such as uh, wa the water tower the, um, and usage of the community center and library. Uh, the location was also vetted with emergency services to make sure that there's no concerns regarding um, the hydrant, and the application was circulated to a variety of staff, agencies, and uh, the public uh, abutting the property, and no concerns were raised through this process. Um, the same as with when the mobile trailer was located at the Dunville Arena, the exact same operating agreement will be required uh, with necessary changes, um, which outlines where the mobile trailer can be located, uh, the, the term or time frame um, for a one-year term, um, hours of operation, and clauses for insurance damage and breach of the agreement. Uh, so overall, planning staff is uh, recommending approval of the zoning amendment, um, and Mohawk and economic development staff are also here to answer <coughs> questions. Thanks, Ashley. Um, are there any questions for staff from <coughs> council? Um, Councillor Lawrence? Yeah, through the chair. Um, Ashley, I had a call from one of the residents. They were concerned about possibly encroaching um, uh, onto the green space outside of the HCC property. You don't see anything of that, that nature, do you? Through the chair, uh, the agreement which is attached to the report outlines exactly where they can locate it, um, and it is signed by the mayor and clerk. Uh, so if they did want to make changes and put it somewhere else for this term or another term, um, the agreement would have to be amended. So at this point in time, they're locating it in an existing paved area, so they, they're not looking to encroach on the green space. Good. Uh, any other questions from council? 
Seeing none, thanks, Ashley. Uh, does the proponent wish to address the committee? And again, you can adjust the podium and please uh, take a minute and sign in. Okay. <coughs> you need my home address or my Mohawk College address? Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Emily Ecker, and I'm the Associate Dean of Community Partnerships and Learning at Mohawk College. And I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today um, to Council today. Um, I'm very proud to say that we have been working with, uh, with Jamie and Lydie and Lindsay uh, for the past two years to bring the college experience to Haldeman County through our City School by Mohawk initiative. This initiative focuses on bringing a post-secondary education within reach for all, particularly those in underserved communities. Last summer, as Ashley mentioned, we were able to bring the City School Mobile Classroom to Dunville, where we offered intro introduction to construction for free uh, for the residents of that community. We are thrilled that the opportunity is again before us to offer further courses and training in Caledonia through the library and through the mobile classroom. We, are commit, we as Mohawk College are committed to strengthening our ongoing partnership with the Haldeman County. Mohawk College's partnership with economic development and tourism and the Haldeman County Libraries is vital to our shared vision of providing access to college level training at no cost and within reach. Our hope is that through courses such as Introduction to Welding, Construction, Advanced Manufacturing, and our College 101 preparatory course, we can animate the pathway for students of all ages to pursue their goals of further education and viable employment. I wish to thank you again for your consideration and a special thank you to the Haldeman County team of Lydie, Jamie, and Lindsay, who's not here, but we truly appreciate it and we look forward to our continued partnership. Good, well, thanks Emily. I see you, Councilor Corbett. Um, Emily, um, is it mainly trades that you're going to offer as far as courses? So, the current mob, we have uh, one mobile classroom and we have another one that's currently being um, <clears throat> built, which will be ready in the fall. Um, the current mobile classroom is specifically outfitted for trades, so welding, construction, manufacturing, those kinds of, of um, courses. The other mobile classroom is more generic. It doesn't have the, the um, welding capability in there, so there are options to provide all kinds of different training. We are, as we look to the future, we're looking at what is the labor market saying, what are some of the... Um, job opportunities for people. So, um, you know, the health sector, the, the um, personal support worker, for example, there's lots of simulation opportunities that we can bring to the mobile. It's very flexible and so the, the opportunities are endless. At this moment, it will be manufacturing Good. and so you, trades. So you just kind of basically look at the market and yes. then uh, have the ability to adapt, which is good to hear. Councillor Corbett, you had a question? Yes, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity of having the trailer and <coughs> Dunville last year. I, I'm very pleased to see it. Unfortunately, uh, those who, all those who could have taken advantage of it, didn't take an advantage of uh, two questions with regard to recruitment. What type of advertisement or informal information is going out? I know last year I had to go out to the agencies and remind them that this was available mm -hmm. for the people to take opportunity of and I'm quite surprised that they didn't fill it from yeah. what I understand in That's terms right. of what those are available. That concerned me. I still uh, believe in the process. And the second uh, question is with regard to the uh, the funding, is this uh, through Mohawk a government funding thing that you have to provide a service, outreach service? No, so, okay, so to your first question about recruitment. So traditionally what we do is um, we have a, a large community outreach team that goes out into the community. This is how we started in Hamilton. And, um, you know, going to where residents are and, and determining what are some of the needs and spreading the word that way also through social media, through flyers, community groups, all kinds of different opportunities. So we've been working with uh, Lydy and Jamie, Lindsay, um, Marilyn Kaus at St. Leonard's, Dave, that whole, you know, trying to rally the whole community to, um, to share the word uh, about what, what we're doing. 
So that would be the same thing that we would look at doing here in Caledonia and starting much earlier. I think part of the problem with Dunville was where it was located and it was hard to get to and it was, it was the summer, like there were a lot of factors. So I'm hoping that as we look towards years and years of our continued partnership, that we can look at different locations within, within the community. If I may just comment, yes. you say a lot of factors, I say a lot of excuses, Sure. and I'm going to take a hard line. we got a bunch of people out there say they're employable. Mm -hmm. This is your opportunity. How come we didn't? <coughs> and that's not your fault. I'm no, just... and I, I didn't want to say that, <laughs> but, I, but I, I agree with you, and I think part of, part of the challenge that happens when you do something new like this is it's about... Um, it's a slow start so we have to build the momentum you know we start with few students came and then as word starts to spread and then you know things will things will come up it started like that for us three years ago when we went down this road and now it's you know we have wait lists for our classes so it will get there it's just you know making people see that and, and hopefully that will happen I'm glad we've seen one success in that area from Dunville and yeah area. absolutely and then just in terms of the the funding uh, to your question um, this is isn't a government funded um, the the iPad initiative that um, Ashley spoke to about the pre-apprenticeship that particularly is um, funded through um, through the federal government it's a it's a three-year project and they are the ones that are funding the purchase of the second mobile however the city school initiative has been um, is the call is part of the college's access strategy so that is um, all of those costs associated with city school is typically underwritten by the college thank you Councilor Patterson? Yeah, just a comment. I will be fully supporting this. I think it's a great initiative. Unfortunately, I think it's, it's taken a long, long time to get here. No, no fault of your own. I think it's, it's a real need in the community as Absolutely. far as trades, especially apprenticeships. I'm hoping your comments or the comments earlier that you can increase that number from three to a full yes. complement going on to your salt fleet into the technical part of it. it it's great. Um, I'm also see that you're open to if this goes off good that you can maybe look at different trades offering yes. you know whether it's heating air conditioning but yep well worth it and glad is here thank you I, I was just saying to um, to Jamie that you know for me and for for the college we're so close you know geographically the Haldeman County is so close to to the Fennel campus so we should be doing a lot more together and, and this is just this is so exciting um, from the college perspective just to be able to to bring our opportunities um, and that future opportunities for students into your community so so thank you for that yeah, no I too think it's a great great initiative and hopefully uh, we have good uptake any other questions for Emily <coughs> seeing none thank you thank you is there anyone else present who wishes to speak for or against this matter I guess that remains at zero who wants to speak for or against so that I need a, a mover and a seconder that's moved by Councillor Metcalf second by Councillor Corbett and I'm going to read out the recommendation on page one that the report PDD-12-219 zoning amendment to permit educational uses at HCCC in partnership with Mohawk College be received, and that the application PLZHA 219-039 to pass a bylaw to permit educational uses be approved for reasons outlined in report PDD-12-219, and that the proposal is deemed to be consistent with the Provincial Policy Statement 214 and Provincial Growth Plan 217 and other matters of provincial interest. And that the bylaw attached to report PDD-12-219 be presented for enactment. And that the mayor and clerk be authorized to execute the attached operating agreement between City School by Mohawk College and Haldeman County, respectively. Any Further comments, clarification? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's carried unanimously. That finishes our public meeting for planning applications. I'm gonna turn the floor over to our great Mayor Ken Hewitt. <laughs> That's not setting me up for something. Yeah. <laughs> 
I'm a real bad belief man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 24 hours. Yeah. After what he saw last night, maybe he's thinking he's going to get an elbow in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> or a cross check. Don must have brought it down. He's got to take his out. Number 18, I'm bringing it. Johnson needs his best of his. Hey, uh, by the way, he's got his watch on today. Nice. Nice. Good for you. Always, always. And I know, and I know you're not on the wagon. You've been, you've been, you've been on that bus for a long time. I don't talk about twenty or no, it's uh, almost since 1967. Since I was born. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Bertie. <laughs> I'm wondering why you don't have your Augusta shirt on. I, you know what? I, I didn't go there, and I, I should have this time because Tiger actually put on a good performance. <laughs> <clears throat> Never thought of it, but I should have put my Leaf jersey, my Tavares jersey on today. Nice. Is this what I'm reading? <laughs> Do I get to read all this? Yeah, all right. So I need a <clears throat> mover and a seconder that the following motions be approved. One being ECW 319 Park Street Jarvis no parking zone. That report ECW 0319 Park Street Jarvis no parking zone be received and that Haldeman County Parking Control Bylaw 307-02 Schedule C no parking Jarvis be out amended as outlined in report ECW 0319. Two ECW 0719 Main Street and King Street Hagersville no <coughs> truck turning bylaw. That report ECW 0719 Main Street and King Street Hagersville no truck turning bylaw be received, and that the required no truck turning bylaw be presented to council for enactment. And three ENG 0419 Haldeman War Memorial Hospital parking improvements. That report ENG 0419 Haldeman War Memorial Hospital parking improvements be received. <clears throat> and that Haldeman County Parking Control Bylaw 307 02 Schedule B No Stopping Dunville be amended as outlined in report ENG 0419. And that Haldeman County Parking Control Bylaw 307 02 Schedule C No Parking Dunville be amended as outlined in report ENG 04. 2019 for LSS 10 2019 purchasing activity July to December 18 that report LSS 10 19 purchasing activity July to January 18 be received as information and lastly LSS 15 19 fourth quarter insurance loss report 2018 that report LSS 1519 fourth quarter insurance loss report 18 for 2018 be received as information. Moved. Councillor Sheridan, seconded. Councillor Lawrence, Councillor Bert, Corbett. Uh, item number three uh, parking improvements. Uh, thanks to the uh, county staff for working out those parking improvements. I can tell you I reached out to the administrator of uh, the hospital with regard to parking and I uh, explained to them it's time for them to step up and provide more off-street parking and I think they're looking at the uh, old the construction site to provide the parking. We've done a lot for them and I, I can't see going and having people pay for parking uh, for a hospital. That's something that's total against my grain, but I have reached out to them. It's time for you to do something now. Council Mayor, Mr. Mayor, my uh, comments in regards to item number two. Um, I just want to um, have to make some comments on this. I just have to because um, I'm, I'm really glad that staff has brought this report forward this morning because um, in my opinion, and I think in the opinion of a number of residents in Hagersville, what's, what's happening in our downtown core at the moment is unacceptable and, can, and shouldn't, should not be tolerated going forward. Um, I, I have an issue with uh, 
trucks in general uh, going through the, our downtown core and along the east-west corridor, which would be most of you know as Haldeman, Haldeman County Road 20 or, or the Indian Line, as it's referred to. Um, but I'll get into that as we deal with the, the truck bylaw uh, report on the next page. But I do want to say that um, as a result of those trucks going through, being allowed, transport trucks being allowed to go through our downtown core, we experienced some of the incidents that, like the one that happened last week, where, where we had a uh, fully loaded transport truck uh, approaching Hagersville from, from the <coughs> east, approaching the uh, stoplight at the main corner, proceeded to make the northbound turn onto Main Street, which he was not supposed to do. There's signage there telling them they're not supposed to do it. Hit the main light standard at the main corner, the steel pole. The thing uh, was swaying. There were several witnesses that saw it. The trucker never stopped. <coughs> he proceeded uh, northbound uh, about another 80 feet down the street, uh, wiped out a Ford Explorer that was parked across the street from our, our new Dinger's restaurant on Main Street North. Again, never stopped. Continued on uh, just north of Hagersville. There were several people who witnessed what was happening, jumped in their vehicles, and now, now we're into the Wild West. They followed them out northbound out near Hewitt's Dairy, and eventually wound up caught, catching up with them and, the, and stopped the truck. But Mr. Mayor, that is just one of a, of a number of incidents that I could recite here and take an hour of your time, but I'm not going to do that. But trust me when I tell you it's one of a number of incidents that have happened at that intersection because there's truckers that either are choosing not to go around the community or don't have the ability to make that turn. And I witnessed it, staff in our municipal building at the corner witnessed it, businesses have witnessed it, residents have witnessed it. It's unsafe, it's unfair to the community, and I think we need to do something about it. I'm gonna be bring, coming forward to council with a notice of motion asking for your help. Um, shortly uh, to, to solve the problem that we're having there. I want to go one step <coughs> further and, and divert the, these trucks right around the downtown core. But for now, I thank staff um, for bringing this report forward. I think it's a great start. I do have a couple of questions, if I can, though, Mr. Mayor, to, to staff, to Tyson. Tyson, can you bring us back any information in regards to what, what would the fine be once we enact this bylaw for, for a fully loaded truck that disobeys the signage, the new signage we're going to put up and makes a turn at this intersection. How high can we go with the fine? Because to me, that, that's going to be the deterrent. Yes, uh, through the mayor. So I'll, I'll work with Randy Charlton, our bylaw official on that, and just and I can get back to council with that number because there is an existing bylaw in effect that prohibits one of the movements there already. So we'll go and review that number. I just don't have the number with me right okay. now. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Second question I wanted to ask you is, have, have we done outreach to the community in terms of, you know, the, the trucking companies, the, the, the companies in the area that, that are moving materials um, on, the, on a daily basis? Um, have we done outreach to those, to those groups, letting them know we're, what we're about to do here and what we expect them? Yeah, uh, through, through the mayor. So as part of the process, I did talk to Contrans, which is the largest. They have about 400 trucks. They're just <coughs> north of Hagersville. And another company, I think they're called Transport Service. They're, I, th I think they're located just on Highway or on Road 20. So I talked to both of them. I circulated the heavy truck route bylaw to them so they saw the routes. and. We actually had specific conversations about the no truck turning and they were both in complete agreement with them. Great. They don't want their drivers turning there. And so there doesn't seem to be any issues because there are other routes and with the heavy truck bylaw, those will be prescribed. So this report really goes hand in hand What's with that? that heavy truck bylaw. Like you yeah. can't have really one without the yeah. other. So yeah. uh, the, the, like I said, those two trucking companies had reviewed it and were in complete agreement with this. Okay. Yeah. And, the last, and the last question I have is, once, the, once these two reports are enacted, are, are we going to sit down and have a formal discussion with our bylaw staff and, and uh, the OPP in regards to doing some re regular blitzes so that we can, it'll help, in my opinion, it'll help get the message out that, mm -hmm. look, here, here are the fines, here are the routes we expect you to follow. If you disobey, we're, we're going we're to come after you. We're going we're to do blitzes and we're going to... Uh, 
we're going to watch very carefully what's happening at this corner because it's, as you say it's not like we're not giving them an option we're, we're giving them an option to go around the community they're, right now they're just choosing not to take it it's 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 shorter quicker by a matter of a couple of minutes uh, but you know they're, they're just choosing to go through the downtown intersection rather than go around the community so can we arrange something like that and have some formal discussion with the OPP uh, through the mayor I I can work with Ray and we can work with Randy just to, because the OPP will be the primary enforcement agency because these trucks are going to be moving and our bylaw officers don't stop moving vehicles. Right. Um, but the, the first step will be to get all the signage up and there's a right. significant amount of signage that will have to go up so that will take a number of months before all that's in place and before okay. it can really start being enforced. So the passing the bylaws is the first step and the heavy truck route bylaw as well. And then over, and then it'll take a, like I said, a series of months, I think at least, to get to get all the signage up, because all the truck routes will be signed. Um, and then once all that's there and it's clear, and then we can, the enforcement part will start. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. <coughs> Councilor Warren. Um, I agree with you 100%, Councilor Delmonte, with what you're saying there with regard to um, trying to deter all the truck traffic. Um, in their downtown core, as you know, we've got the issue in Caledonia with going across the bridge, and they do still try to take liberties and go where they're not supposed to. Um, I agree with it 100%. <clears throat> My concern, as you brought up, is that we can act all the bylaws that we want, but if we don't enforce them, then they're really kind of mute. I guess is the best way of putting it. So I, I feel that, just like yourself, that we need to sit down, that once these become law, and hopefully they will. I think it's a no-brainer that uh, we can um, incur some action to make sure that this is incurred and that we deter all these trucks from coming to the downtown cores where they're not supposed to as well. Councilor Sheridan? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, number three, I do uh, improve, or I like staff's suggestions about the parking improvement, but my also question is number five, our fourth quarter insurance last report. Um, our self-funding that we do, that we chose to do a few years ago when we um, changed our, our insurer provider, how is that working out? And I know every year it's a different situations that arise and just want to make sure that our self-assured amounts is, is still adequate. So if you could maybe comment on that. Currently, they appear to be still adequate. We're still reviewing um, from uh, every year we analyze how, how the reserve reacts to whether we're below or above. Um, currently, we're in, a good, we're in good shape. And it, in staff's opinion, over the years, it seems better to self-insure um, for those losses as opposed to paying out the insurance premiums. Um, and watching where we are with those levels to ensure we're funding it properly. But we're okay. still in good shape. Yeah. We're still seeing good trends in that regard. Okay, okay. And I, I know every year does change, but I thought with this being the fourth quarter, we'd have a better idea how the year went and where our numbers uh, landed. So, so if, if you refer to the report um, in the... Um, and the financial implications. So we did use approximately 142% of the budget for the year. We did have um, a major claim that was in litigation <coughs> resolve throughout uh, 2018. So we did, there was a large expenditure. I believe it was 100 and it's approximately 175,000 was paid out to the external insurer for that claim to resolve because it, it resolved below our deductible. Um, so that eats a big chunk of that. Yeah. So that's not something that occurs every year. We do have, um, we have been having a lot of um, external claims with insurers that have been with even previous insurers coming to resolve recently, um, which is good news that they're going to be off the books. Um, but when we see that happen, it causes a, a large variance in the reserve. But that's not something we can anticipate will happen every year. And in that regard, I believe the reserve is still in a good, good shape, good position, and our self-insured retentions are still appropriate. Good, good. I did notice that, and that's why I thought how it impacted that going forward. So thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, 
maybe just just to further this further, I did, I give uh, Dana. Dana's not going to pat herself on the back, but I give Dana the, the credit um, because we're self-insuring and we're in here. We're dealing with issues right up front and quickly. And I think a lot of times when these types of issues come forward, if you can deal with them up front right away before they begin to escalate or there's frustration on the, on the part of the individual that's got an issue with the county, uh, we're able to come to a resolve much quicker and I think for much less money uh, within it. And so by having these deductibles, it, it provides us more authority to be able to deal with those. And so. Um, you know, it's those ones of I tripped and I broke my glasses and I'm out $250, what can I do? As opposed to there's nothing, go see your lawyer, and now I tripped and fell and broke my glasses and I need $250,000 from you for, you know. And so it's all those kind of issues that I give Dana complete okay. credit. We've been able to manage them in-house, in deal with them relatively <coughs> quickly, and we've been very successful because of it. Good. Excellent. So <clears throat> are you guys on the same topic? Yeah. Okay, so Dan first. Then. Um, Dana, on the, I noticed like the uh, claims in auto were up uh, from 44 to 59. Um, it was up 15 claims, but are the, if you can answer this, are <coughs> auto claims, are they from county vehicles hitting private vehicles or are they vehicles hitting or being damaged in a county parking lot? Whereabouts do they come from? I just, that's out of curiosity. They can occur from all of those things. So, um, if it, under the umbrella of the auto policy, it would uh, we would take all those things into consideration. Any incidents that occur with a third-party vehicle, so an incident that happens on the roadway, or an, an ex incident that happens within a parking lot in our own parking lots. So that can encompass anything from uh, one of our own vehicles backing into something or even a windshield claim. So those would all fall under, you know, um, one of our trucks driving down the roadway, a large rock hits the windshield, that would fall under the umbrella of our auto um, policy. Um, that was, is, is taken care of in-house. That's not something that we would submit to our insurance company. Only things that exceed our deductible of 25,000 under our auto policy would be su submitted to them. <coughs> Um, unless it involved a third party where there is potential injuries. So, and I can say that a lot of our incidents too are, are sometimes weather dependent, uh, depending on the winter that we have um, and things of that nature, we could see a lot more incidents um, involving our own county vehicles and they could be relatively minor in nature. Okay. Corbett. Thank problem. you very much. Uh, doing our due diligence, I know we do take steps to mitigate accidents, but uh, taking a look at the overview, when I see someone somewhere in our auto where we've got four claims for uh, backing up, do we have a disciplinary policy or some pot type of policy to deal with these types of issues? So right now we actually, in, back in I believe it was 2014, we implemented the Vehicle Accident Review Committee. And that committee is, uh, uh, there's a number of people that sit on that committee that review all of the incidents involving our fleet. And when an accident occurs, even if it's relative, uh, relatively minor in nature, a windshield claim, whatever the case may be, right to our larger uh, incidents. <clears throat> It's reviewed by that committee and recommendations are submitted with regards to how we believe um, it should be handled. Uh, recommended to the manager of the division, including uh, whether we feel that a disciplinary action would be appropriate, and in that case they would work with HR in that regard. Uh, right down to whether we just feel it would be more appropriate to have further training for that staff member, or if there was mitigating circumstances where we didn't feel that that was necessarily a preventable incident incident from the operator's point of view. And thank you, and I understand you have taken disciplinary action in some cases? There, I believe there has been disciplinary actions where appropriate. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Patterson? <clears throat> yeah, on a different topic. Yeah, Thanks. yeah I think they're all. Um, just back to item two, Thanks, and without beating this to death, just a comment about signage and perhaps Council Damani is bringing this up in a future motion, I don't know. Signage is great, and I've talked to a couple of folks on staff, but majority of these incidents seem to be coming from the Nell's Corners direction. So it'd be really nice if we had a large sign, size of the screen, a four by eight sheet of plywood or something, prior to these trucks getting to the Mackenzie Road or getting into Hagersville, so they know not to get downtown. I mean, it's great that we tell our local trucking firms, but there's a ton of outside 
the county firm. So if they get into Hagersville, it's too late, right? They're, they're going to be to Brantford before they can turn around. So I think staff's aware of that, but let's not get into the same trouble we got in the quarry and the signs are the size of my book. Let's make them big. And there's no ignorance then. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to read those five motions uh, again. <laughs> I do have a mover and a seconder. All those in favor? That's carried unanimously. <laughs> Councillor Del Monte. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. We'll move on to um, the uh, first report under Community and Development Services on page 72, and it is in regards to the proposed growth amendment number one. Um, I can just ask the clerk's area, though we, we do still need a motion to receive this report, right? So can I get that on the floor right now? Motion to receive, move, move by Councillor Lawrence, seconder, Councillor Patterson. Any questions on this report, Councillor Corbett? Am I reading into this that we may uh, <coughs> increase the size of the hamlets or to some degree? Flexibility. Through the mayor, um, uh, this, of course, is still proposed, uh, but should it be uh, uh, ultimately enacted as, as proposed, what the intent of um, uh, the, the change as it relates to Hamlet settlement areas is, is simply a rounding out. So it's, it's not to um, allow for an expansion of a Hamlet to facilitate a, you know, a 10, 15, 20 lot subdivision. It really is just working around the edges. So, for example, where... Um, Someone may be proposing you know, two or three lots, uh, but the third lot is is a little bit short in terms of its ability to um, uh, to accommodate a septic system type of thing. The intent of the policy is to allow for a little bit of a rounding out of a hamlet uh, to then accommodate the space that's needed for that type of thing. If I may, would that include gapping of some sort? Uh, through the mayor... Um, I'm thinking of South Cuba area where they've got one house uh, that, that's a lot removed from the hamlet. Would that be one of those areas where you'd be rounding out or is that something totally different? Uh, through the mayor, um, that type of thing may fall into consideration, but really uh, what the province is working through right now um, are our criteria uh, that uh, that one would have to satisfy uh, in order to be eligible, if you will, for um, for those uh, those those rounding outs. Um, I, I would assume, um, if anything, that would be as far as the province would push things or allow things to go to allow for you know a, a full individual lot. Uh, again, to my initial comment, it, it's the intent here is not to allow for multiple lot developments. It's 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 really just working at those edges. So. Uh, something um, that, that you're alluding to there, Councillor, is probably the extent or how far that they would allow things to go. Thank you. Further questions on the report? Mike, I have one. On, on bottom of page 74, you make a specific note of the fact that the province's draft mapping only encompasses about 25% of the industrial park area. <coughs> Which area are... are, are are we referring to there? Through the mayor, uh, and perhaps this could have uh, benefited from a map, but um, the preliminary mapping from the province, um, uh, it only identifies Stelco proper right now, so where the facility is, is fully developed. Uh, that's what the province has mapped. Uh, we've had uh, a lot of dialogue with the province. Um, uh, both Lydie, uh, Romanuk, and myself have attended. Um, uh, a working group session where, where we've had the ear of, of provincial representatives. We presented them with mapping. Uh, we followed up through the EBR and again uh, presented them with mapping uh, that uh, expands upon that area uh, and uh, essentially captures the entirety of um, the Lake Erie Industrial Park. Uh, we've, we've had fairly um, positive response from the province. We haven't seen obviously the end results. Um, but they understand, you know, our position, where we're coming from. And I think it was really just a, um, an issue of the province not fully understanding the extent of Lake Erie Industrial Park. Uh, I think their thinking was um, that it was Stelco. Uh, so we've had, um, I guess, the opportunity to educate them uh, a little bit. Uh, and there's a, uh, as, as I see it, a, a much better understanding now of um, what exists in terms of designated area opportunity and that type of thing down there uh, so uh, uh, we've we've made our uh, we've made our proposal 
to uh, to extend that mapping and, and now we just wait for uh, for their response. When you say this Delco area, are you talking about the plant itself or are you talking about all their outlying property that they own, the whole thing? It's just the plant itself. Just, wow, yeah. that's incredible. I just, um, no, I just find that really strange when you consider <coughs> the fact that the Ontario government has told us in the past that they does it, you know they re recognize that area out there is an area of significant employment lands the ontario government in the past was involved with with townsend and you know we all know why townsend and the other lands that were bought in haldeman county were bought by the province with the intention that that area was going to explode and and you know then the creation of regional government and i i in all the and all the tours and uh uh, work that that's been put into by the county and by the industries in terms of trying to showcase that property I just find it real I found that really surprising that that, that that's all they would have designated in their mapping was the pl the steel plant itself that's just amazing and when you look talk about all the other infrastructure that was put in out there to accommodate growth I, I just found it shocking that that's all they would have in their mapping so I really appreciate what you've done here in highlighting to them that hey, there's a bigger there's a bigger opportunity. <laughs> Any other questions on the report? The motion has been tabled. All those in favor? It is carried unanimously. <laughs> Page 76. Uh, we're dealing with a budget reallocation regarding uh, the population forecast report, and uh, the motions on page 76 can have a mover and seconder to get it on the floor. Moved by Councillor Lawrence, seconded by Councillor Metcalf. Any questions on this report? Councillor Corbett. Yeah, if I may, I think the th one thing we should do is let the public know that that uh, park, water park project come in under budget. There was quite a concern in Dunville that everything we're doing <coughs> was under the budget. So this is a good news thing. If they're that much under, I'm wondering about the lighting in Wingfield Park. But again, we have been under on that budget. It's been criticized in many ways by many people that here's an instance where we $71,000 under and the public should know that. Thank you. Any other comments on the report? Mayor Hugh? Just um, <clears throat> so the fallout of this report is going to give us some data and information to support uh, the reallocation awards and and and, and whatnot that uh, that eventually are I guess through clerks or through some form of staff or consulting that council is going to be looking at. Your Worship, this this information can be used for a variety of things, including the the, the ward issue as well as the development charges work that's that's going to be discussed later. Um, but fundamentally. This, this is also really, really important to having the necessary um, supporting information for our growth strategy. Right. So point being is it's important work to do. It's important to do it right, and it can be used for a variety of purposes across the corporation. Well, it's going to serve a number of, as you say, a number of different I purposes and ideas, right? That's correct. Any other comments or questions on the report? <laughs> Motion has been tabled. All those in favor? It is carried unanimously. Report number three is the community partnership program regarding the, the potential for Dunville splash pad on page 79. <clears throat> Motion is there. Can I have a mover and second to get it on the floor? Councillor Corbett and Councillor Shurton is seconded. Uh, questions, comments? Councillor Corbett? Uh, I'm very much in support of it. I know when we had our uh, town hall <laughs> meeting that we did have the community that ha are buying into it. The lions and lionesses have been on the uh, in the books for some time due to health uh, problems uh, with the proponents. It's been delayed some. My only comment is here: I under I see the indication if there's a splash pad, then we're going to do away with the uh, lighting pool downtown. I'd like to have assurance up <coughs> front that. The acceptance of this is not contingent on the approval of the pool being taken because I'll tell you that needs to be vetted in the community before that happens. So again, it's simply the splash pad, funding for that. When we get to the other, which is what, 2023, 
then that's where the uh, discussion comes. So that's my concern. Don, you'd like to comment yeah. on that? Yeah, I think it's important. I mean, <clears throat> in each community, splash pads and wading pools. Wading pools are standing bodies of water that we add chlorine to to use. They're not, the, in this day and age, they're not the most ideal situation. In each case that we've put in our money and maintained the ongoing operating cost, which the initial money is seven hundred plus thousand um, dollars. That's that's the first one time. The ongoing cost of these are quite expensive. In our experience in in, uh, in Caledonia and Hagersville uh, 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 runs that out. They're very technical. There's lots that can go wrong with them. They're quirky, and so the cost of operating them is is quite expensive. And the cost of replacing them obviously is another seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, which will never get cheaper as we move forward. So the thought has always been put in a splash pad, remove the wading pool. And we've done that in Caledonia, we did it in Hagersville, and the expectation of staff is that we would do it in, in, in Dunville as well. Um, and that was the whole reason for going to splash pads. You don't have to guard them. The hours of operation are much longer. Once you get good weather, you can turn them on. They run themselves, they can shut themselves off at night. You don't need the staffing. Um, and they're clean and, uh, and, and they're welcoming. And so um, I, I think as a council, it's, and we've done this before, you don't want to go down a path where you haven't made that other decision. So in, in, from my perspective, it, it, it'd be best not to approve this today and have the community consultation to decide whether or not you're going to keep that other one open um, as you move forward. Because if you approve it today, you start raising money and you get ready and you got the money to build your new one, and then you try to go back to are we removing this one or not? I don't think there's any chance that you're going to be removing that one. We've seen that with every asset that we, we've got within the county. And so um, that would be my recommendation is that you, you today you either buy into it, that you're, that's what you're going to do like you've done in all the other communities, or you, uh, or you just hold off on the report and you do consultation before you approve it that you have an answer on what, what, what's going to take place. Because you could put the, you know, different location, put the splash pad where this current location is. Doesn't have the great parking. This is gonna be a big attraction for that, that, that part of the downtown. There's a lot of thought that's gone in. The, the proponents wanna have it in this location. It won't take away from an indoor pool down in that location. So if you put it down there, it doesn't preclude having an indoor pool if that's where, you, where it's chosen. But again, that, that hole is a other debate, but it's not gonna preclude that. But the issue of doing this and not making a decision to to close the other pool with that expectation, I think is an answer that I, the council probably would want to have before moving forward. Okay, Councilor Sheridan. Uh, yeah, a couple of things, uh, and Don touched one of them. Um, myself, you, you don't need both. So if we're going down that road, waiting pool gone, no questions that I'd be supporting that. Um, number two, I did want to know if the selection is chosen for this location for the splash pad, would it preclude or, or impact a, a potential indoor pool at Lions Park, knowing that we have about three quarters of a million dollars to improve the existing Lions pool? Um, so I, can staff comment? I guess Don has commented, but can Phil, maybe you can comment? So uh, through the chair, so uh, <coughs> we would have to look at, uh, you know, everything uh, in totality. Um, when we redeveloped the park currently, we did have a location, and that's what's shown on the plans now. But uh, if, uh, as we look at the indoor pool options, uh, we'd have to look at the site in totality and, and make a determination on uh, how we could accommodate everything. So it would be more infrastructure like water and sewer and that, that type of electrical issues if you were to expand? Uh, through the chair, the location may need to change from what's shown in the plans now. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm aware of the comment that's been made, what I seems like one or the other. And if that be the case, I'm sure many of those public who utilize that waiting pool downtown, and it's great to see the families downtown. It captures the downtown people who can't uh, afford to drive down every other place. I would certainly like to see it vetted in the community because the understanding here is the 
we're approving a, 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 a splash pad, but in doing so, we're taking this away from you. What do you want? And I can assure you, you're going to get one great pushback from the community. Even talking to my wife, she said, you're not going to get rid of that pool, are you? I listened to her. <laughs> <laughs> so if I may, I think before it goes forward, and I certainly don't want to hold it up, it's got to be vetted in our community. Uh, I know what uh, Councillor Shurton says, but in looking at it from my ward and seeing those families downtown utilizing that pool, that's something I'd like to see continue. But So do you want to defer? Oh, hold on, I, Mr. Manley. I just want to raise one point of clarification, and that is your capital budget already has a, uh, a project in 2023 to decommission the waiting pool. That was done without the splash pad. It had to do with this, the condition of this, the facility, the age of the facility, and the intent was that it had reached the end of its lifespan. What's being suggested here is whether or not you're going to have two facilities and as the CAO pointed out that's not been what's been done in other places but to be very clear it's always been the intention that in 2023 that waiting pool has reached the end of its lifespan. Okay. Well, the question I have in other municipalities that, that we're aware of, are, is that the trend that we're going, they're going towards eliminating those waiting oh, yeah. pools because of the liability and all these, all these <coughs> other problems that you run into? Don, you alluded to some of it, but can you comment on that? Yeah, no, this has been a trend for the last 15 years um, or more, as I've been here 12, so it's probably the last 20 years <laughs> that that's been the trend yeah. in, in getting rid of waiting pools, uh, just because of the health concerns and, and just the, the playability. At one point in time, they were, that's what you had, right? It was a way to cool off in a hot summer, yeah. uh, but definitely the trend is, is, the, other, is the other route. Yeah. I know in Hagersville, we're dealing with a different situation because both facilities were in, the, were in the one part downtown, but the response that I got from the public was, number one, the, the splash pad was a much better uh, um, feature to have in the park and, 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 and certainly well well used much more well used than, than the pool and smart idea is what I got from the public it, it was a better better way to go parents don't have to watch those toddlers as close you know and then there's much less uh, opportunity for the, the kids to get into trouble running through a, a, a splash pad I will recognize Councillor Lawrence and then Councillor Corbett I agree that once we had the splash pad come into Caledonia um, it took over from the, the waiting pool um, immensely, exponentially. The waiting pool sat stagnant for a lot of times. Yeah, there would be four, five, six families maybe at most. That splash pad is constantly being used. So use, it's, there's no comparison between the two if you've got to choose between one of the two. Efficiently, cost, that speaks for itself as well. That You really need to move forward, I think, with the splash pads. Mr. Corbett. Yeah, I want to be very transparent with my, the citizens in my community, and I think the idea with your coming here to have an addition, approve the addition, and the way we go, status quo. I know you got things that are in the capital budget forecast out there, but you take a look at them as you go along. So I don't know what position I am. I'm certainly in favor of it, but I'd like to see it... Uh, thrown back and have some public input because if that's what it means it's either this or that or can you change the venue to accommodate the people in the downtown area that's a discussion i'd like to see happen so you want to defer okay, i'm looking for a motion to, to defer uh, with with proper wording <coughs> The clerk just give me something here that reads the consideration of report CDP 03 2019 Community Partnership Program. Read the Dunville Splash Pad Project be deferred pending further public, sorry, deferred to a future CIC meeting pending further public consultation. I'll second it. So you're moving that? Yes. Herbert? And Councillor Patterson is second. That. And if I may have uh, said that, will the uh, county facilitate a meet <coughs> meeting for me to have that discussion? I'll look to staff for that, Mr. Manley. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay, the motion of deferral has been uh, tabled. 
this. <coughs> this motion, all those in favor, is carried unanimously. We move on to the next report on page 94, the naming of corporate assets, specifically the Caledonia River Walk. And the um, motion is on page 94. Can I have a mover and seconder to get it on the floor? Councillor Metcalf and Councillor Shurton has moved and seconded. Questions and comments on this report? <coughs> Councillor Metcalf? I think it's a great idea. I know Mr. Clark was a great philanthropist uh, in the Caledonia area, uh, spent a lot of his private dollars to, uh, to enhance that area and was, uh, will certainly be missed in that area from what, I, what I've known of the Clark family and, and continue to uh, support the Caledonia area as well as all of, all of Haldeman because I know when the arena was built here in Cayuga, there was a sizable donation from the Clark family to our, uh, our arena project as well. Well, it's, I think it's a great idea. Okay, thank you, Councillor Metcalf, Councillor Corbett, and then Councillor Lawrence. I echo uh, Councillor, <coughs> my good Councillor's comments here, and I was astonished to see the many other uh, organizations <coughs> that he uh, contributed to. So I'm pleased that he's, it was from our community. I know what he'd done in our community. I think that's an honor well deserved. Okay. Yeah. Lawrence. <clears throat> yeah, I want to thank my fellow <clears throat> counselors for their comments and, and staff for this report. Um, uh, for us that have grown up in Caledonia, this is uh, what the Clark family has done for us, not only in Caledonia, but as you have now seen across the county and across the province um, of Ontario, um, what Ron Clark and his family have brought to us is... Uh, it can't be measured in words, uh, thanks, you name it. And for this, uh, the naming of the river walk that he initiated for that whole facility down there is just a, I think a small token of our appreciation that's uh, well received. And uh, he certainly has set the bar for all of us to, um, to contribute to our communities, um, whether it's you know, financially or just human resource, because that's the one thing about Ron Clark, which he always did, was he, uh, he was one of those guys that, uh, well, his famous saying was, let's get the job done, and he jumped in and uh, with two hands and uh, got dirty himself. So um, I just want to thank staff again and council, and I think this is uh, just well-deserved and look forward to it by everybody. Mr. <coughs> Patterson? Yeah, just one additional comment. Um, I echo all the words that were said. I had a call from a family member in my ward, so I won't give the name away, but if anybody knows the family, you can probably figure out who it is. Before I got this package, I don't know the individual. Anyway, I just want to forward his comments that the family is very, very appreciative of this. So the people from Caledonia can probably figure out who I'm talking about. But. Okay, I see no other hands, so, so we'll deal with the motion. that has been tabled, all those in favor? is carried unanimously and I have no other business listed that I was made aware of <laughs> <laughs> well I don't know whose purview it comes under but I did send a note about Esplanade Park and I thought it was uh, a community service thing and if you would entertain it under here is that as you know the success of the park has given us problems and uh, I know Randy has been involved. I know uh, the OPP has been involved. I've got four, count, uh, four citizens out there, and I know they tell me I should post up a sign as Councillor Shirton Ward. <laughs> Give the phone number for him. <laughs> However, okay. it's your age group, Bernie. I'm calling you. <laughs> <laughs> However, the success is such that it's filled up. This past Sunday, we had people in there. They were they were parking overnight in the park. They were lying on the pier, congestion everywhere, and it's causing a problem. I know they have a program. I'd like to have them talk about it. They say it's going to occur in 2020, but folks, that's too late. We have to address the problem not now and not then. So I wonder if I can get some response from either Randy or somebody on staff as to what are we going to do to address those concerns that I don't have to get Councillor Shurton's calls. 
<laughs> oh. Grant, Randy, can you come forward? No, I think it's Or, Phil, or Phil. 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 Phil through, well. through the chair, so uh, I can respond. So over the last few years, we've seen increased usage and uh, we've uh, continued <coughs> to respond, whether it's uh, increased um, number of uh, washroom facilities, increased uh, cleanings of those facilities, increased garbage removal, and our new initiative that uh, was approved in operating and will be ratified soon. Uh, we're gonna have permanent staff that are uh, taking care of the waterfront in Port Maitland on the weekends as well, where I think we have most of our problems. Uh, we're also gonna do some um, uh, work through operating to temporarily improve that parking area uh, to help out, and, and that's going on right now. Um, roads and, and facilities and park staff are working together to improve uh, that. There's also, um, uh, staff are looking at uh, changing some of the parking regulations uh, in the in the area to try and improve uh, movements. So uh, there are a number of things going on. Uh, the bigger fix is uh, in the budget for 2022, and and is being well planned out now. Uh, and we've experienced similar similar situations in La Fortune, Lower La Fortune Park, and um, it's an iterative process, and and uh, we'll continue to respond. My concern is we got a uh, Victoria Week holiday coming up, and again. I'll get the calls. <coughs> I'll get the calls. Uh, through the chair, uh, uh, we're taking that under advisement and we're getting prepared for that weekend, so we'll make sure we're staffed up to do the best we can. Councilor Sheridan. Uh, thanks. Uh, I do get calls too, but the reason you're getting calls, you want to be on that police services board. The whole town knows it. They call you when there's police issues, so that's why they're calling you. But I am getting the calls. I do understand they did put um, a portable washroom out there this week. And I guess normally we don't put our porta potties out there till May 1st. Uh, through the chair, the bulk of them go in May 15th, but uh, speaking with the, the manager and because uh, we're having such a busy early season, we're gonna try and get them out there earlier. So we're working with the contractor to get them there sooner. Yeah, that's one of the gentlemen I was speaking yesterday. It's weather related and you get a spike of 18 degrees and social media telling about how good fishing is out in Port Maitland. Next thing you know, instead of having 200 people, you got 2,000 people out there. So that's where the people are coming from. But I do really do think a fix is, especially in the early spring um, season when the ground's really soft and people are getting stuck there, I think we should have the ability to close off the, the ability to park on the grass. Um, they're rutting it up. And I know that parking is, a, is at a premium down there, but when it's soft and they're running up and getting stuck, that's no fun either. So I think a quick fix would be to eliminate at least parking during the, the spring season until at least it dries up too. So hopefully that will be taken into advisement. Yeah, through the chair, we've had to do similar things at La Fortune Park. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Mr. Metcalf. Just a comment, maybe another boat ramp somewhere along the uh, South Shore in Ward 2 might alleviate the phone calls that Mr. Shirton or uh, Councillor Shirton and Councillor Corbett get. It may be an opportune time, but I, I'm on the same wavelength. I was down there the other day and there's ruts that are two feet deep in that park area. Uh, all the reports from the MNR are saying that the walleye pickerel fishing has never been better in Lake Erie. And, and like Councillor Sheridan alluded to, that we're gonna see more and more tourists come this way so they're not fighting the traffic going north. And uh, I think it's an opportunity that uh, we may look at for the future as well, thank you. Advertisement from Cuga. <laughs> Don? Yeah, through, through you, Mr. Mayor. I, I think the one thing that I, I caution on here is the fact that we're everything to everybody at no cost, and so, we, Port Maitland, we've put some money into it. There's lots of people who go down there to picnic and all that. But the fact is that we have a, a private operator who has a beautiful dock facility on your way down to get to Port Maitland that you can go in, easily put your boat in. There's lots of storage area. He's paying commercial taxes to us. And, um, and they have great facilities. Okay, all right. And, and so, all the demands going down right to Port Maitland to squeeze into a small space to go into a, a dock to go out there when we have a private, you know, a private uh, a commercial operation 
that's on its way down there that doesn't charge very much at all uh, right there. And so we have the same thing that we have up in Caledonia with Harrison Flats who, uh, um, and, and with La Fortune Park. We've got a commercial operator paying tax, a beautiful clean facility with all the amenities there and, and providing a service. And I think it's $10 to put your boat in. Um, and, and so that whole, you know, are we competing with the private sector to, to, to provide free access? And this is, you know, one for council. I mean, there's no, everybody's gonna have a different view over the person who's hiring people, paying taxes and doing it in a very organized manner. Uh, with, within that area, within our own community. So um, I don't think there's a one answer for all, but I think it's one, it's the, it is the yeah. debate, the thought that, that what business are we in and what are we trying to, to support as we, as we move along down in that area. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, I see no other hands on this issue, so I'm going to pass it over to Councillor Corbett. <coughs> Thank you very much. And that was one of the discussions we had with regard to Esplanade Park. For perhaps it's time to put a gate and start charging for the usage down there. Uh, on the list, uh, page 119, I have the heavy truck route. Can I have a motion to get it on the floor? Motion by Dan, seconded by Rob. Uh, discussion, and I have. Uh, Ray here, if Ray, you want to give us an overview or Brent? Question? Uh, yeah, I think uh, this is good. And um, I had a chance to meet with uh, Ray. And uh, I know one of the things we thought, I know in the Dunville area, there's a preferred route that people take the shortcut down North Shore. So we're maybe going to put a sign up at Taylor Road to try to, try to get some deferred over to Highway 3. Um, so I just think with the, some of these changes, and like we talked about earlier under the earlier report in Hagersville, um, signage will be a key. And uh, I know Ray and Sam in our area are looking at putting signs up to uh, educate the public and the traffic. A lot of these drivers are following GPS, and they're not even seeing the signs. So um, it will be important to uh, have bylaw and the police involved too to to uh, follow up with this. Thank you. Before I get to Tony and John, Ray, do you have anything you want to put forward, or you just take questions? Well, I support the bylaw. Um, it's been a long time in the making. Randy and I have looked at it. Staff, Tyson's staff, um, the trucking heavy truck routing in the county is now consistent. Um, there's not a lot of changes in what was previously being practiced, although there were problem areas in almost every district. We think we've addressed those. Um, it also clearly defines the non-truck roads, which is really what this protects. It protects your investment in the roads that aren't capable of carrying the heavy loads. So I think it's a good policy. Thank you, Tony. Mr. Chairman, I, I, again, I'm really glad to see this report come forward and I have spoken to, to Ray about it. And um, I'm really happy to see the penalties listed on page 125 because to me that's going to be the deterrent here. I mean, we, we can do our outreach to the community, we can work with the OPP, but if you catch, if you catch one or two, uh, do, you know, following a route that they're not supposed to be following and, and, and issue a couple of fines, the, the word's going to get out pretty quickly. To, to obey the truck routes as, you, as you're, you're traversing the county. I guess, you know, I, I'm going to go back to, to a comment I made on the earlier report, and that is uh, the truck route through Hagersall on County Road 20, we've got to identify it as a truck route, and I certainly understand why. But I, I do feel, though, that something should be done to divert those trucks that are going west to east, east to west, along uh, through our downtown core around the community so i'm going to bring a motion forward to to do just that to to ask for council to 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 declare a route using um, concession 11 i guess it would be and uh, the sandusk road and divert those trucks around the community because as you said Protecting our asset. We, we just got finished spending over five million five and a half to six million dollars in Hager's over re repaving all those streets and what, what we're seeing going through our downtown core 
over time is going to destroy those that work that we did. Number two, it encourages the turning movements at the downtown core, which we know trucks don't, don't seem to be able to, to make. So I, I'll bring that notice of motion forward, but I guess my question to you here today is, do, is, is that a viable route to, to, to divert those truck track truck traffic around Hagersville east to west, west to east? Yeah, it's like um, like our discussion that we had a week ago. I think there's a couple of issues here, Tony. Um, 20 is an existing truck route. It has been <coughs> for years, right? So for us to, you know, defer trucking around Hagersville per se, I think there needs to be an in-depth review, uh, a couple of things. Number one, is there a viable route? And number two, are those roads capable of loading, loading. truck loading? Yeah, right. uh, and if so, perhaps, you know, what's the cost to, to upgrade those roads? So I don't think it's something that can happen right away. No, no. So I, I'll ask for that to come forward, but I just wanted to, to give you a heads up that, that that's where I'm going, and, and I would ask for a staff report to give staff the time to look at it. But I really feel that something needs to be done because if we don't, our, our downtown residential streets are being used as, as routes. Um, it's encouraging trucks to go through our downtown courts, tying up traffic. The downtown intersection isn't designed to handle it. I think most people on Hagers will accept the fact that Highway 6 is a uh, provincial road. It's servicing many customers, including the, the biggest one out in the industrial park, and they accept that until the province uh, steps up and decides to, to do something different down the road. But, but I think to, to, for the community to have to accept the fact that now the east-west corridor is becoming another heavy truck road, I think that's, that's where I draw the line and say it's, it's unfair. It's unfair because we, I don't think there's any other urban community in this county that is subjected to this kind of truck traffic. And I, I really feel it, it's a detriment to the downtown core. It's going to ruin the work that we just did uh, in terms of concrete uh, at the intersection, <coughs> the curbs, the, the, the roads that we've repaved, it tie ups traffic, ties up traffic downtown. The incident a week and a half ago is just an, an example of probably 25 that I could recite to you and I'm really concerned about, about, about the safety in our downtown core, and, I, and I'm getting it. I'm getting those comments from our chamber, from our business community, from our residents, and, uh, and I would imagine if we sat down this afternoon and talked to Phil Carter, he'd have a lot to say about it as well. Anyway, I'll come forward with that motion, and, uh, but I'm really pleased to see this come forward because I've got other areas of my county, or my ward, uh, Haldabick Road, and those areas where, where Tyson and I have responded to numerous complaints as well. So I'm really pleased to see this come forward this morning. Thank you. And you're speaking to your notice of motion already. So yep. you'll get that on the books, John. Yep. I just noticed that we're very, very, very under service by the Ministry of Transportation as far as enforcement vehicles. Every time we see the statistics, it's always zero. So I never see the green and whites in the area. And we do have a large truck uh, truck industry is uh, in our county. There's a lot of truck movement through Highway 3, Highway 6, and I just noticed through the statistics that there are no, uh, not a lot of charges being laid if we, <coughs> if we do see those as well. Thank you, Dan. Um, Ray, I wonder if you, we talked or mailed back and forth a little bit. Um, if you could address the situation that I was, my concern is with regard to our local contractors, like whether it's Montagues, Almas, Norton, <coughs> Um, using those routes, um, they need them for doing local business. Exceptions where they fit in with this bylaw. Yeah, there's exceptions in the bylaw that um, I had some concerns actually about that section, so I reviewed it in detail and we added some wording between myself and Randy. Um, there's, there's language in there that allows local deliveries for services and goods. Um, and it also allows anyone working for the county emergency vehicles, uh, basically. More importantly, I was concerned about someone perhaps infilling a lot off of a truck route with multiple loads per day or per week. So we've put language in there to cover that off. Local contracting, building one home, is still allowed to take the most direct route, the shortest route, from the truck route to the, to the destination. Good. Um, through the chair. Yeah, I just wanted to comment um, because this is the, 
discussion about the truck routes. In my area, I've been getting numerous calls. Um, just to bring the council up to speed here, I know the mayor's probably got a few calls too, and maybe Councilor Corbett. Um, the shoreline down there off Vanilla Drive and Derner, um, they're repairing a break wall uh, down there, and it's not just one cottage. There's probably about 40 cottages that have kind of banded together, and they got uh, a large break wall section being built. And because the ability to get it started and with our truck routes um, maybe not being compatible down there um, f for the t to get access there I've uh, basically Ward 5 knowing that there could be some damages to the road that I thought it was important to get this work done now this time of year as opposed to when the tourists are there in July and August and having all that truck traffic down there then so I've uh, basically um, put up basically like a bond for any repairs that need to be done. I know the public aren't totally aware and that's kind of why I wanted to bring it up here today because uh, they're concerned that the road is getting damaged and nothing's going to be done. They pay taxes and who's going to pay for it? Well, it is going to be covered off. There has been some challenges with two different contractors down there uh, with trucks sitting there all day long, um, which weren't really the plan. But anyways, we're working through that, but I just wanted to um, make that uh, a public announcement about that area down there, and they're trying to get that work done before people can enjoy the, the summer season uh, out there at the lake. Thank you. Any more questions already? Just to Rob, how's it being paid? Uh, through the vibrancy of fund of Ward 5. So it's not affecting tax. So it's not affecting the, the taxpayer themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. You heard the motion. Those in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you. Other business, I have one, and I understand the uh, Alder Street uh, West contract has been let. Could you give us some indication with regard to what is going on, timelines, etc.? Uh, through the chair, the, um, the the Alder Street contract for the last section um, closed last Tuesday, and uh, Almas was a successful bidder on the project. So, and they were the Almas did the work last year. So they're looking to start as soon as we get all the paperwork done and get their schedule. But they're looking to try to complete all the work down there. Um, I was talking to Dave Almas, and he's going to try to get it done by the uh, the end of August to be complete that the rest of it. Thank you. That's good news. I know they're uh, pouring asphalt in the November area, so I, I think it's better to get it. I think it was December earlier. even. <laughs> November and December. Yeah. Uh, I don't have any other issues. I'll pass it on to Councillor Metcalf for Engineering Capital Works. Thank you, Bernie. <clears throat> uh, we have a report uh, ECW-08-2019 Concession 12 and Sandusk Road Tollway Zones, page 133. The motion is on the floor. Do we have a mover? Councilor Patterson, second, and Councilor Romani. <coughs> Any questions of staff? I guess Councillor Sherton. So I guess the the rationale for this report <coughs> is basically to uh, help um, take away the extra traffic that's parking there that are swimming illegally in the quarry. Yes, uh, that's the rationale behind this. Uh, staff comment on that, Mason. Uh, through the chair. So yeah. So based on uh, discussion at uh, the last CIC with. There was a uh, no stopping zone instituted out there last summer. It hasn't proven to be enough of a deterrent to stop the people from coming in, parking and going into the quarry and the rest of the sort of nuisance noise and littering and stuff that goes on. So um, Randy uh, has looked into it and based on discussions with council, um, the next step is a towway zone. And so that's what this does. It takes those areas that were no stopping. They'll be re-signed as a towway zone and that'll give uh, bylaw staff and or the OPP the ability to tow vehicles away. 
um, after a 15 minute period just to make sure that there's a small grace period in there. But sure. Randy's here to, he could answer any questions about the actual enforcement of it, but that's the intent. The cars okay. will be towed away from there. I guess my own follow-up question. So we've contacted a couple, uh, I guess, towing companies that would handle this <coughs> once this is followed up. Like, do we contact them or do we just wait till this happens and then they call whoever they want? Like, who is called for that vehicle to be towed? Through your, through your chair to answer that, respond to that. We already have towing companies that we do on occasion tow cars with, so we con the officers will contact the companies to come and take the cars. Yeah, okay, all right. Councillor Patterson? Yeah, just on this topic, I had a call from a resident last week on this, and he was one of the original people that came and did a deputation, I'm gonna say whenever it was last summer, fall over this issue. Yeah. So I, while well, Randy's here, or staff's here, I guess I want to just make sure I didn't misspeak or, or lie to the individual. I said it's on the radar, it's coming formally today, and my understanding is that we're going to have it hopefully up and running, and what, what the appropriate word is, pleased or blitzed or whatever you want to say prior to the May 2-4 weekend. Is that factual or did I perhaps misspeak? On the timelines. Yeah, I would. <laughs> I, dear, Mr. Chair, again, to answer that question, we have staff that have volunteered to work the Saturday of the May long holiday weekend, so we'll be there in force on Saturday to begin that enforcement once the signs are up. And it's so the, just to follow up, the, the signs will be up prior to the May 2-4 weekend, the bylaw we passed, and we'll be all set to go. Mason? Uh, through the chair. So yeah, the intent is to get the signage up there and then there'll be bylaw enforcement staff there. So the bylaw, we know it's going ahead now. It'll be formally passed next Tuesday, and then it'll be in effect, but until the signage is up, we can't do the towing until then. So yeah, we'll work with roads operations on that. Uh, Councilor Del Monte. Mr. Chairman, and I, I'm really pleased to see this report come forward um, because I, I've been over there a lot watching what goes on. I've, and I've even had an opportunity to talk to some of these kids and you know, and I understand why they're coming out because some of them will tell you that you know, Port Dover has become so busy that uh, th these kids are looking for, for other places to go that, that aren't quite so con congested and so forth. And I understand that, but it's the safety issue. So I, I think we're, we're making the right move here and I think it'll go over well in the community. But I did have an opportunity just uh, late last summer at the peak of this to talk to somebody in, in our MPP, to Toby Barrett's office, and I just mentioned to him that th this is part and parcel of the problem when the province allows these quarries to be mi mined for the many years that they let them mine it, and there's no rehabilitation program in place to deal, to deal with the empty pits and all the waters in there. It becomes a, a nightmare for, for the municipality, and th this one's coming true, and I encourage them to to do whatever they can at Queen's Park to, to come up with some other, some ways of rehabilitating these quarries and putting them to better use. Thank you. Yeah, chair recognizes the CAO. Uh, thank you. Uh, through the chair, um, I guess with Ray and Brand, I just want to share the the, um, uh, the the signage, the uh, locates. I guess have we have, are, are we prepared to do this for this time frame? Because this is this is critical because we're setting expectations and I know we're into the middle of April. It's something like the 15th or something like that in there, and and we're a month away, right? And so, um, are we prepared for the signage and that to have all that in place? Yeah, we haven't ordered the signs, but I would think we have the time uh, once the order is placed as early as today. We can certainly install them because we have the posts in place. So, so there isn't any underground issues. They're permanent posts in place. Yeah, they're in they're in place basically with our no stopping signs. Okay, because I know we had before temporary ones that got thrown around, and so we yeah. now have permanent signs in place. So if we can order the signs today, with the expectation that this is going to be passed at council, just to get that done. It just has to be done. The signs need to be in. I'd like them in a week before the May two four, just so that we're 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 there it just there's too many um, commitments we like to under promise and over deliver and this is just one that whatever we need to do um, you got the approval but I would just order the signs now so that we're 
and order extra signs, whatever you need to do. Yeah, I, I should share uh, with council. Somebody is removing the posts on a regular basis, so we've had to schedule a replacement of these posts uh, probably three or four times since they were installed, but yeah. it's an ongoing issue. Okay. okay. Councillor Delmonte. I just have one question to staff. I'm not sure who can answer this, but is the owner of the property been made aware of what, of what we're fully aware of what we're doing <coughs> And has the owner of the property offered up to do anything better than what exists there today? I mean, there's, there's more holes in that fencing than, than what you'd see in a slice of Swiss cheese. It, it's, re, it's ridiculous. Like, the fencing's not being kept up. The holes aren't being blocked. The, the, there's no attempt to, to secure the site. And yet, in, in the past, when it was in different ownership, there used to be 24-hour security on that property. So we've gone from that to, to, to nothing. And, and it, when you drive by it, it's like quite clear. The, the, owner, the owner doesn't care. The owner is just let, let, letting it go on and we're, we're dealing with the aftermath. And there's a public expectation that we're gonna deal with the aftermath. I don't think it's fair. Anyway, I, I don't think there is. A I don't think there is an answer for it. We, we know right, that the, 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 the land loaner is, is we'll describe as delinquent on, on, from a perspective of fencing and security of their property. Okay. I just have one more question. On the signage, is there a number when the car gets towed away, is there a number the person calls to get their car back? Or on the sign, will it be... <coughs> Uh, to answer the question, typically when cars are going to be towed away, uh, we'll notify the OPP that we've towed the car away. Naturally, when somebody comes and their car is missing, they're going to call the OPP and say, hey, my car is missing. Okay. And the OPP I, will have a record there saying it's been towed. <clears throat> Just because if, you know, they come back from the quarry after swimming and it's gone, they think it's stolen. But, okay. Because <clears throat> I know in some places, some municipalities have a number, a 1-800 <clears throat> number they call. And uh, because it is a towaway zone, but yeah. okay. most of them aren't surprised when they know the car's gone and they, they're parked by a towaway zone. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> we're gonna Any more it. questions, comments? <coughs> Seeing none. <coughs> just uh, read the motion that report ECW-08. Dash two zero one nine concession twelve at Sandus Road Tollway Zone be received, and that Haldeman County Parking Control Bylaw three zero seven slash zero two be amended as outlined in this report, and that Haldeman County <coughs> Parking Control Bylaw three zero seven slash zero two schedule J Tollway Zone Hagersville be amended as outlined in this report. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimous. Next is uh, report ECW092019, Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, Rural and Northern Communities Grant Application, page 137. <coughs> Motion to approve. Motion. As seconder, Councillor Delmonte. Questions? Yes, Councillor. Corbett? If I may, I thought this was uh, given that we are get the money, get the money, but I understand it's a competition, and I'm concerned about our qualifications <laughs> as we're in such good financial position. <clears throat> Is that going to be a negative uh, for us? And if we are successful, with how smooth other projects ahead? Uh, through the chair, um, yes, this is not um, money that we're simply getting. Um, this is a um, competitive application process. And um, as outlined, I, it was a letter that we received back at our last application. We'd asked about that. Like, we are at a disadvantage compared to many other mm -hmm. municipalities because one of the factors that comes into this is your ability to pay. The other one is the condition of your infrastructure. And in both cases, we're doing really well. And so those are um, check boxes against us that we don't have going into this process. So what we've done is we've selected the project we think has the best chance of getting the money, 
but there's no guarantee on it. Um, and the intent is if we do get the money for Raynham Road, it's in the hot mix resurfacing program, that we would take that money that we're getting and accelerate a similar amount of projects forward in the hot mix program, essentially moving a number of projects forward one year so that the public and council can actually see the effect from getting that money. So that's the intent if we get it, but I wouldn't, um, based on how the application is set up and some of the criteria, I wouldn't hold your breath that we're gonna get funding through this, this type of application. Thank you. Any more comments or questions for staff? Thanks. Seeing none, that report ECW 09. I'm gonna, I'm gonna oh, interrupt, uh, if you don't mind, John. I, it just, uh, it's six minutes after 11 and we've got uh, delegate uh, here for 11 o'clock. So we'll, we'll just uh, die, go there and then come back to you after. Is that Craig? I was just going to say, I think it, it's just, he, he was just going to have the motion, yeah. just the motion approved finish, and yeah. that'll put this to bed. Yeah. It'd take 30 seconds. Okay, then. <laughs> guess, guess overruled. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that report ECW 092019, Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, Rural and Northern Communities Grant <coughs> application be received and that the Raynham Road Resurfacing Project uh, from Road 53 to Road 55 be submitted for the funding under the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, Rural and Northern Communities Grant Application. All in favor? Opposed, if any? Carried unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so on page 31 of the agenda, uh, report FDS M0119, Municipal Study Results of 2018. <laughs> And Not Jim Raziz is here today to present from BMA Consultants. And uh, we'll just get it set up. And Jim, you can uh, have the floor. Th thank you, Your Worship, members of Council. Um, as, as you mentioned, I'd like to present the uh, results of the 2018 municipal study. Um, uh, just in terms of the background of the study, um, each year uh, various municipalities in Ontario participate in the study. Last year there was 108 Ontario municipalities that participated in the study. And in fact, that represented over 86% of the population of the province of Ontario. So in terms of comparisons, it's, it's quite intensive. Um, we're showing uh, graphically, <coughs> because we can't show 108 municipalities on a graph, uh, we just picked nine Ontario municipalities, either by geographic location or population, just to give you an indication how you compare against those municipalities. But as well, in the, in the graphs, as I'll, I'll show you, uh, we have shown the average of the total of the 108 municipalities. Um, so in terms of the um, presentation, or in terms of the study rather, um, what we determined is we tried to isolate all of the factors that affect the financial condition of a municipality. And those being, there's socioeconomic factors that affect the revenues and expenditures. So we're looking at things like population change, uh, demographic uh, composition certainly has an impact on expenditures, uh, income, average household income, 
Um, and in terms of the financial factors, we're using key financial factors that, in fact, credit rating agencies use uh, in determining the credit worthiness of a municipality. So you can see, uh, in terms of the financial factors, uh, we look at various revenue financial factors. Uh, we look at expenditures, uh, both on a per capita and, and per assessment basis. And then um, some key financial performance indicators uh, related to uh, debt and reserves. So first of all, in terms of the uh, peer comparator, as I mentioned, there's nine municipalities. These are the municipalities uh, that uh, we compared against. Uh, you can see from here that uh, the land area, uh, you have a significant land area and a relatively small population. So your population uh, density is only 36 uh, people per square kilometer. Uh, in relation to the other municipalities, uh, Norfolk, Chatham, Kent, Brent, are fairly similar. But, uh, for example, Brantford, uh, a, a denser population. Um, having a, a, a low density, this requires uh, more infrastructure, especially linear infrastructure. Um, so there's more kilometers of roads relative to the population to support that, uh, that infrastructure. So that, that, that's a little bit of a challenge for the municipality. Um, so in terms of growth and economic indicators, uh, it's important to look at those. Uh, and so we're looking at some of the internal and external factors that affect these. Um, the uh, population and uh, socioeconomic indicators, it provides an insight into the ability of the municipality to, uh, to generate revenues. Uh, you can see from here, uh, this is Stats Canada data. Uh, you had a population increase between 2011 and 2016 of 1.6%. In comparison to the group average, the group average over the same time period was 2.2%, and the provincial average was 4%. And, and just to, to stress, that provincial average obviously includes uh, the high growth uh, GTA municipalities. So Jim, just, just Councilor Sherry. Yeah, just, just a quick question, just because we're in 219, right. and we're using data that's eight years of age. So. Three years. Why aren't we more updated? Is this just because every five years we get the update? That, so that, we're always five years behind? 16, yeah. It's the last census. Yeah. That, that, that's correct. It's, it's 2016 data. Um, the, um, I, I do have uh, information from Manifold Data Mining that do a, pro, uh, a projection on, on population. And from 2016 to 2018, oh, okay. According to their projections, it's around about a 4% increase. So there's been significant growth since the last, in Haldeman, yeah. since the last uh, census period. Yeah, that's but, what uh, I wanted to say, because it's looking like we're kind of behind the group here. And if you look currently, we're much better than what we are in this period. So that's my only comment. Yeah, and, and that's reflective. I'll show you the, uh, the assessment data. Okay. It's reflected in that as well. Uh, so in terms of the population increases, you can see significant increases are fairly significant increases between 2011 and, and, uh, and as I show on here, the 2018 uh, projected. Um, in terms of age demographics, uh, again, it's, it's stats cat in information. Unfortunately, they only do it every five years. But what this tells us is that uh, what you have in comparison to Ontario, uh, your population 65 years and older is higher than the provincial average. And in 2016, you had a lower percentage of working age population. But as, I, as we were just talking about, you had signif you've had experienced significant growth between 2017 and 18. And as a result of that growth, that's mainly the um, uh, people in the uh, um, working class, working age population, and, and young families. So that will have some impact when you so look at the next uh, data from Stats Canada on demographics. Sure. Uh, building construction activity on the left hand side is the uh, actual uh, construction activity in Haldeman. And you can see it's, it's from 2015 and this uh, includes 2018. It was, it was healthy uh, construction activity on, a, on an absolute basis. Unfortunately, we only have uh, data to 2017 and those other municipalities. And you're at the group average, uh, but below the uh, uh, survey average. And, and how, uh, just to show for comparative purposes, what we do on that chart is we take the total construction average over the three year period and divide it by population to kind of put it in perspective. 
Um, in 2018, uh, you've experienced 2.3% assessment growth and 19 taxation years, 2.7. So that's an indication that, uh, again, going back to the population, that your population is increasing and your assessment obviously is increasing as well. Um, weighted assessment composition. Uh, it, it's important to understand this from the perspective of, of uh, where are you collecting your tax dollars. And um, the, the, what municipalities strive to do, what the leading practice is, is, is try to get those tax dollars from the commercial and industrial sectors. Uh, you can see from this chart, um, the, in terms of the total assessment composition, about 78% of your tax dollars is, is derived from the residential sector. And that's in comparison to the peer average of about 66%, and the total survey average about 74%. So you're slightly higher where you're collecting the funds. And, and that's a result of, if you look at the commercial sector, it's mainly in the commercial sector, you're at 8.1% uh, in terms of collecting from the commercial sector, where the peer average is about 20, oh, close to 21%, and the survey average is 14.6%. So again, uh, it's, it's, it's good to understand this because uh, in terms of economic development, uh, you, that's the area you probably be, you want to uh, try to attract. Um, so the richness of the assessment base, what this is, <coughs> is taking the total assessment base, and again, that's where you derive your revenues, your tax revenues, and we divide it by population to give a kind of an indication of how you compare against other municipalities or the richness of the assessment base. And you can see that uh, it, an assessment base is critical to, to the ability, as I say, to raise revenues. You're, you're just slightly below the group average and below the survey average. And, and again, the survey average includes a lot of those GTA municipalities with uh, a lot of commercial and industrial assessment. Um, so so uh, this is 2018 weighted assessment. Um, so again, it, it's uh, just slightly below the, uh, the group average. Uh, in terms of average household income, um, this is uh, 2018 data. And again, the source of this data is data, uh, manifold data mining. Uh, and they do a, a projection for us uh, for <coughs> average household income. It's very complex. They look at tax returns, et cetera. Uh, and you can see that the uh, average household income in Haldeman is slightly above, above the group average, but just slightly below the, the survey average of, of different municipalities. Uh, so in terms of the financial indicators, did I do something? Okay. Um, so what we look at in terms of financial indicators is, as again, the, these are indicators used by uh, credit rating agencies to determine the credit worthiness of a municipality. So there's various indicators uh, under the heading of sustainability. That's looking at financial position per capita, assessment composition, uh, consumption, flexibility, uh, which is the uh, reserve position and the debt, and then vulnerability tax re receivable as a percentage of taxes levied. Uh, so in terms of the financial position, the financial position is the total financial assets less the total financial liabilities. And again, for comparative purposes, we're doing it on a population basis to bring it in perspective. And when you look at this, in 2017, the latest uh, financial information return from the municipalities, um, your financial position is the, uh, the highest amongst the, uh, the peer municipalities. In fact, you're way above the uh, group average and uh, you far exceed the uh, survey average. So you're in an excellent uh, financial position. In fact, when we look at the whole 108 municipalities, Haldeman on a, on a financial position per capita is the fourth highest in the entire survey. And as I say, the survey represents 86% of the population of Ontario. Um, so we look at the trend line. It's important to understand that as well. Uh, where you're trending, and, and that's good as well, because uh, from 2015 to 2017, although your, your uh, population has increased, your uh, financial position per capita has increased as well. So your population trend line, or I'm sorry, your financial position trend line is, is, is positive. Um, so it's also looking at uh, um, your asset consumption ratio. In other words, what the asset consumption ratio is, is looking at the amount of assets that essentially have been used up. And um, with you, when we broke it down between um, uh, tax, 
the tax assets, uh, water assets and wastewater assets. When we look at the tax side of it, about 50% of your infrastructure is what we call amortized or depreciated. And um, that's higher than the uh, group average, slightly higher than the uh, survey average as well. What that shows, that's an indicator that although your, your assets are probably in a good condition, um, this indicator tells us that um, to plan for the future. In other words, you start, should start putting away uh, into a capital reserve for the replacement, uh, refurbishment of those capital assets because they are getting, getting up there in age. Uh, we look at the water, you're only 38%, uh, very comparable to the survey and group. And then wastewater, uh, again, you're, you're comparable to the survey and group average. Just, just a question, Jim. So on your asset consumptions, you're, you're going to basically take old assets that might be on the books that we know down the road we're never going to replace. That's correct. So eventually they're hurting us, but they're going to come off the books completely. So how is that reflected? Yeah, that, it, it's not, it, it's a good point. It's not reflected in this chart. Uh, this chart is, is a, a high level macro indicator. And, and what it tells me is that, oh, geez, I should look at this and, and getting drilling down to the specifics as you're talking about and, and finding out actually what the, the condition of those assets are and if there's any assets that uh, won't be uh, replaced, refurbished. So, and that, that goes into, uh, and I think you've undertaken an asset management plan. So that's the level of detail that that asset, that, uh, asset management plan would drill into. <coughs> Uh, reserves, it's, it's, it's important for reserves, as I said, for capital replacement. It's also important to have uh, stability in, in tax and, and user rates, uh, for, especially for unforeseen circumstances, one-time events. Um, it ensures adequate uh, cash flows, and it provides some flexibility. Uh, so when you replace or refurbish your assets, uh, instead of issuing debt, if you have uh, reserves that uh, you could use those to, uh, to fund the capital uh, project. Um, so the tax reserve, uh, when we look at tax reserves as a percentage of own source revenue, and again, it's, a, it's a, a financial indicator that credit rating agencies use, you're way above the survey average and the group average. So your, your reserves are, are in a obviously excellent position. Uh, when we look at uh, water and wastewater reserves, uh, you're, again, like, uh, you're above the survey average and group average in, in uh, water reserves. Well, Jim, yep. what did you do? I didn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> last time you let me. Yeah. The, um, a couple slides ago, you, you mentioned that we should be thinking about putting assets away for replacement, capital replacement, okay. on, on some of our assets because of the consumption. But then I see here our reserves are in very good condition and in fact above average, not just on the tax side, but on the water and wastewater. So it sounds to me they're kind of contradictory. I, I, so so what, what that tells me is that yeah, you are doing a good job. So uh, we're just showing it the, the indicators. And, and as I say, the, uh, the indicator for the uh, asset consumption ratio for the tax side was high and, it, and the uh, uh, to, to compensate for that, you should be putting in reserves. And then from this slide, you have in fact been doing that. Okay. So it, it's, so when you tie it, it balances together, a, we're, act, we're, we're, we're doing what, what, you're what you should be doing. Yeah. Okay, good. Correct. Great. Yeah, I too am trying to rationalize that same question about uh, what you're coming up with, that we're in good financial position, but it masks some other issues that we have, tax arrears, debt, infrastructure, lacking industry and, and uh, commercial assessment, becoming a bedroom community and our age is going up. How do you rationalize that? We can say we're in good financial position, but we're lacking in these other areas. Is what I hear being said, we're kind of dressed sad here. Um, yeah, what we're showing is, is, a, is a point in time where you are today. And, and what you're talking about is some of the uh, some of the economic development uh, things that are happening in, in the county. And um, uh, I, I think uh, 
that has to be looked at in the context of a, an economic development strategy. So it's important to understand where you are, but it's also important, as you're, you're talking about, to understand what the trends are in terms of economic development, and then to uh, come up with a strategy, if it's, a, if it's a, a negative trend in any way, what can we do in terms of economic development to, uh, to uh, reverse that negative trend? So as these are, yeah, it's a snapshot in time. Yeah, what I'm seeing is, yeah, we, we can say we got all kinds of assets, but we're failing in this other areas. Uh, yeah, I, I can't, I, from the, the information I have and looking at the uh, economic, uh, or I'm sorry, the socioeconomic data and the financial data, uh, I don't see where you're suffering. Yeah. Um, this might be back further too. Uh, so 14.5% of our taxes are being derived from commercial and industrial, 4.4% from the agriculture sector. Right. We've got 1,252 kilometers, square kilometers of area for Haldeman County. In relation, Jim, do you have the breakdown of that 4.4% taxes, how many the percentage of the farmland is of that 1,252 square kilometers? Uh, the per no, I don't have the, the percentage uh, of the total area. But, in relation, everybody yeah, is. but that, that's a good point in terms of the, uh, the farmland assessment. It's higher than the survey average. And of course, farmland assessment is only taxed at 25% of the assessment. Um, so wastewater reserves, uh, you're above the group average and survey average. Um, debt outstanding. Uh, so first of all, we're looking at the total debt outstanding. Uh, you're, you're slightly above the, uh, the, the survey average, but you're, you're below the, the group average. And when I talk about total debt outstanding, this is water, wastewater, uh, all of the debt uh, incurred by the municipality. Uh, so when we, we just want to isolate, okay, what's the debt that's recoverable from the tax base? So we isolate that and we look at the debt outstanding uh, relative to the tax base. And you can see, again, um, when, you, and when you look at it on a per capita basis, you're just slightly above the uh, survey average, and, but you're below the group average. Uh, just on that, Jim, like, and I don't want to pick on, but the neighboring municipality it looks like it's in better shape right now on debt outstanding per capita, but you go back three slides and they're a lot worse. Like, shouldn't there be some similarities between the two slides? Uh, you're, are you referring to the reserves and then the debt? Is, is that the, what you're looking at? Well, I guess... I think I, I could put it in perspective. Okay, great. Yeah, I, let me try it and then we'll see yeah. if it answers your question. Um, so that the, uh, okay, and then when you look at debt on a, on a 100,000 of weighted assessment, again, you're slightly above the survey average, but below the group average. But it, nevertheless, your, your total debt outstanding is, is manageable uh, relative to your tax base. I, this is, uh, I'm not sure if this is what you're getting at. Uh, one of the things that credit rating agencies use is uh, what they call the debt to reserve ratio. Okay, this, yeah. This will yeah, be. okay, and then uh, what they, to be financially prudent, what they recommend is you should be a, approximately one-to-one. -one. So for any dollar of debt outstanding, you should have a dollar in reserves. You're at uh, 0.3, which means you're excellent because you looked at that reserve balance and then you looked at your, your debt. Um, so relative to that, you're only, uh, um, for every dollar of reserves, there's only 30 cents in debt. And then when you look at the comparison to the other municipalities, uh, you're in fact, the best of all of the municipalities we compared against. Right. And then in terms of the survey average, the large survey average, you're, you're much better than the total survey average as well. When we made the decision to front end some of the CBF funds to put into the community and some of the different investments that we've chosen, we've chosen them where we could have used the reserves, but we've leveraged debt where it was in our best interest. interest to continue to grow the reserves. And so we're, that's why we're in that position to, ha, you know, to, to be able to service that debt uh, in a much better way than most. Sure. Okay, uh, taxes receivable. Uh, so again, credit rating agencies, 
they like to see that figure below the 10% level. And you're, you're just approaching that, that 10%. Um, so you, and you're, you're higher than the group average and higher than the survey average. But I, th I think there is, I'm not sure, I remember from last year, there was a, uh, a situation that uh, you're dealing with this. Uh, and I'm not sure if it was the Stelco properties, but uh, that's not what it was. And, uh, and, and again, you're, you're managing it. Uh, cost of service and affordability indicators. Uh, when we look at cost of service, there's, there's a lot of variables. Uh, I, I won't go through them all, but you can see um, the variables on, the, on this slide. Um, so when we're looking at it, it's, it's not entirely an apples to apples comparison, but uh, to get that, you would require a lot more in-depth uh, analysis. But nevertheless, it, it does show, it does have an indica indicator. Um, so we look at the levy comparison. This is the levy per capita. So that's the total taxes that you're collecting divided by the, uh, the population. And when we look at this, um, you're below the survey average and below the group average. What this tells us is that your expenditures, your net expenditures on a per capita basis are uh, extremely good relative to other municipalities. You're lower. Um, so um, you, you're amongst the lowest in the peer group and also lower than the survey average. Uh, and then when you look at it on an assessment basis, that weighted assessment, uh, because your expenditures are low, even though your assessment base was, was relatively low, uh, when we look at it, you're, you're still below the survey average and the group average on an assessment, 100,000 of assessment. Um, water and wastewater costs, you're at the survey average uh, in comparison to uh, the other municipalities. Uh, and then I did note in 2019, I think you lowered your rates by 1.2%, uh, so you'd be when we show it next year, you'll be more competitive. Um, when we look at the uh, average cost of service, what this is, is we took all of the residential properties and um, uh, calculated the average assessment across the entire municipality and did that for all those all the different municipalities. And then we, we applied the tax rate to that average assessment. And then on that basis, when we look at the, uh, the average cost of service, uh, because you had that low spending, you're below the uh, serve, and then rolling in the water and wastewater rates, you're still below the survey average and below the group average. Uh, and then the, uh, the, the next one is, is looking at the property taxes as a percentage of average household income. And as I talked about earlier, you, you have a fairly good average household income. Um, we look at it in comparison, and then and your expenditures are, are relatively low. So your, your tax rates uh, are, are very competitive. So when we look at the property taxes as a percentage of average household income, you're below the survey average and below the group average, which is, which is excellent. Um, and then when we roll in the uh, taxes, the, the total municipal burden, taxes and water and wastewater, again, you're, you're much below the survey average and the group average. So just to kind of quickly wrap up, your population growth uh, a lot of your socioeconomic uh, factors are, are positive. Demographics, we, we talked about at age of population, but I think you'll see a, 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 re, a reverse <coughs> in the trend uh, with the new families moving into, into uh, the county. Uh, richness of the assessment base, a little bit of a cautionary note. We talked about the uh, um, commercial assessment being relatively low in comparison to some of the other municipalities. But as, as you grow and the population increases, uh, I think you'll see a, an increase in commercial assessment on a go-forward basis. Uh, the tax asset consumption ratio, although it's a cautionary note, as we talked about, your reserves are very healthy. Um, so um, I think you're, you're managing that quite, quite well. Uh, and then in terms of debt outstanding per capita, all the debt indicators are good. The debt to, to reserve ratio is, is good. Excellent. Taxes receivable, you approach in that uh, 10%, so a little bit of a cautionary note there. Um, the levy per capita, all of this, this the affordability indicators and the spending, uh, again, uh, you show very positive results in all of those indicators. And your worship, that's the end of the presentation. Questions to Jim? Well, I guess that you, uh, you did a wonderful job. You, you, you answered all their questions before they could ask them. So. Good to hear. But, uh, no, it's, I, I, Jim, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to have you here again, just uh, you know, to enlighten us on what's happening uh, you know, here in Haldeman, but how we are in terms of uh, our peers. And so 
seeing uh, the challenges that we face, and we do continue to face and understand them, but uh, knowing that while we face those challenges, we're, we're saddled with uh, the strength of staff to ensure that you know, we make those financial decisions along the way to keep our reserves robust and, and, and keep our, uh, our, our you know, overall tax levy in a, a competitive and, and, and positive situation with respect to the rest of the community. So I thank you for your presentation. Uh, Bernie? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you know, we get criticized in the public as spending like drunken sailors. And to me, this shows that we're not doing that. We're very prudent and we're looking after the, the uh, citizens' money well. We have fiduciary responsibilities re is gained or achieved, whatever you want to say. That's correct, yeah. Okay, so I need a mover and a seconder that presentation material from Jim Brzee's BMA consultant. And memorandum FDS M0119 municipal study results 2018 be received as information. Um, and Mr. Metcalf seconded. Lawrence, all in favor? That is carried unanimously. <coughs> and. Is it you or is it Phil? It's, I think it's going to be Brent. Oh, Brent. Brent, it's got a verbal update or short, presentation. or short little presentation on the. Okay, so. <laughs> I didn't recognize I almost didn't recognize it. I saw him down the operator. <laughs> He could have got he could have got the haircut in Mexico, bro. <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying to him? I'm a hot rider. True. <laughs> you just don't want to go off too far <laughs> back here. <laughs> in Mexico, is it? Good spot for haircut. Uh, uh, yep. Through the mayor, um, thank you for the opportunity to be able to come and present this uh, central administration building construction update. Uh, progress to date and while, while a bunch of this stuff may be obvious if you drive by the site there's there's some items in the or bullet points in this that um, maybe aren't quite as obvious the structural steel 99 percent complete a um, couple outstanding items for the structural steel are the entrance canopies metal roof deck is complete the parapet walls at the top of the roof deck are are constructed Insulation, installation of electrical equipment, conduits and reference are underway. Um, installation of rainwater leaders and sanitary piping is underway. Installation of HVAC equipment and ducts are underway. And, and I'll have some pictures as I go in here to try and illustrate some of the stuff that's been done. Installation of the fire suppression system is underway. Installation of the interior steel, steel studs and door frames are underway. Exterior sheathing is, I say, complete. Um, the intention was that it was complete, but there is a small uh, wall on the west elevation that they didn't get to just due to conflicts with other operations going on at the time. Spray foam insulation is underway. Uh, some of it you can't, hopefully in the next day or so, it will be more visible, but there have been spray foaming parapets and, and walls that you can't see driving by. Uh, masonry subcontractor has mobilized and is underway. Um, they got their scaffolding put up and they've they've uh, installed their brick ties, so they're ready to roll as soon as uh, the spray foam is done. The roofing subcontractor is also mobilized and underway. He's uh, they're actually on site today, doing what would be the flat roof in the council chambers area. Uh, one of the photos that I was sort of referring to, this, this is uh, the main lobby looking west towards council chambers. So you'd be, if you're in the main lobby, standing around the, the customer service reception desk, looking towards council chambers. Um, see if I get this right. No. Anyways, the, uh, over the blue tarp towards the back, you can see the opening out of the actual entrance to council chambers. Off to the right, you'll see the ductwork's been hung, steel studs are in place. 
uh, to the right there, that's POA, and a little further down past that ladder leading up is where um, the committee room is. Um, elevators to the right, and in the, in the main lobby, is uh, I'm sure you're aware, there's display cases, and there'll be seating for the public and, and whatnot. Above, up top, is the, uh, the natural wood decking, which will be exposed in the lobby. To the left is it'll all be windows nice open and you'll see some renditions further on this is the basement so uh, a number of days through the winter it looked like nothing was going on there's actually people in the basement working so in the basement here you can see the the sprinkler piping um, in place dock works in place rainwater leaders in place steel studs um, are all in place. This area will actually, it's, it's um, storage areas for the various divisions. So in, in, inside of this area will be cages where they, they um, have storage. Off to the left is a corridor and then um, further to the left is a mechanical room, electrical room and whatnot. But work was happening when it was nasty outside. They're in the basement completing a lot of this internal uh, infrastructure. This is a, a picture taken last week of the self perspective from, from the, the arena. Um, and basically anything that's the, the yellow, the dense glass sheathing will either end up with a brick veneer or a composite panel. And anything that's an opening will end up being a window or a curtain wall. And you'll see it as, as I go to the next one, it sort of it shows this perspective with uh, hopefully the, uh, the, the, the architect's rendition. As today, and hopefully uh, fall of 19, that's what we're, we're looking at. You can see council chambers down on the left, sloped roof. As I say, they're working on the flat roof, so you see the two yellow boxes sort of down by the slope roof they're doing those flat roofs down there today hopefully if, if if weather cooperates they'll continue with the roofing and within the month the roofing will be tight the building is <clears throat> somewhat watertight because right now every time it rains it rains inside so we we can do certain items like steel studs and door frames and whatnot but you can't get into drywall Charging for not complying with it. got any questions jump in if, if, if need be Great. Yeah, just a general question. Are there any unexpected contingency issues and then are we on time within budget? Uh, nothing out of the ordinary as far as contingency issues. Um, everything seems to be going fairly straightforward, pretty, pretty um, no surprises per se. Uh, on budget, yes, within the time frame. Thank you. Uh, the original survey didn't cause any major problems or major issues. Was there an issue with the original survey to the construction of the project? The construction survey, there was, there was um, an issue with the benchmark uh, that was caught fairly early on, and uh, we addressed it uh, as best we could at the stage of the construction. Anything else? Good. Oh, good. Thanks, so, Brent, for the update. Uh, <coughs> certainly looking forward to. Uh, oh, you're not. You're oh, still. Don't they proceed with. Uh, yeah. This stuff, sir. Um, two month look ahead. Again, weather weather cooperating. Complete the spray foam. Complete the masonry elements. Complete the roofing. Complete the interior steel studs and door frames. And I should say, right now. Basement's done, first floor's done, second floor should be, as far as the steel studs, complete by the end of the week, so that'll just leave the third floor. Um, under that blue tarp in the, in the first picture was, was the, the actual doors. The frames are going in, they're, they're, uh, they're going in as they go, but the doors are on site. Install the aluminum window frames and begin install glazing. R aluminum win window frames started yesterday and uh, hopefully they proceed very quickly. Same thing ties into our spray foam, so moving along. Uh, 
interior drywall once we get the building t uh, water tight then we'll, we'll they'll, uh, start the drywall continue the mechanical electrical rough ends um, place a heat recovery unit on the deck the heat recovery unit HRU is actually sitting on site and I think they have a lift scheduled for the 29th well they'll drop the uh, HRU up on the roof deck it goes off the side of the penthouse and backup generators also on site and it'll go on they'll do those lifts together yeah I, I gotta ask <laughs> penthouse it's not the usual penthouse no, it's, uh, <laughs> okay, <I should. laughs> I don't. mechanical penthouse okay sorry. um through the um mayor thanks for the update brent um i know your main contractor has there been any issues with some of his subs because at the end of the day, you're only as good as your main, but sometimes your subs cause some issues. Um, do you see anything moving forward uh, with any of the subs that we had involved with this project, or is it, has it been working pretty seamlessly? Going forward, I see absolutely no issues. Um, Flynn roofing, a very reputable. Uh, Bothwell, very reputable. The mechanical electrical contractors, both very ref reputable. Um, you could say we had some hiccups with our site servicing and concrete con uh, structural concrete contractor, um, but we got through it. Got through that. So moving forward, you look, looks like very comfortable. With okay. What we have on. Good to hear. Good to hear. Yeah. Um, also, install the, the the entrance canopies. They're they're pouring the footings for bases for those structural steel elements, but they're not on the critical pass. So it's deal with watertight get the building watertight so we can get onto the inside and they'll they'll address the canopies um, when time permits and then Chippewa road, or street road road work and site grading um, trying to hit a comfortable window of weather knowing April's not good may hopefully May's uh, a little better if they they get a, an opportunity to get in there and and uh, do some of that work Substantial completion and occupancy. Um, this hasn't changed. The story's been the same pretty much all the way along. We're shooting for substantial completion in, in fall 2019. Furniture and outfitting um, may run side by side with substantial completion or we may go to substantial and then start outfitting, but uh, same thing, fall of 2019. Office moves, late fall 2019. And uh, we're, we're in the process of, of trying to see which, who's first and, and whatnot. But as, as we get closer, we'll decide on, I guess, uh, what, off, what offices get first, which groups get moved first. But um, also, there's a, there's a number of subcommittees, as you see, working on furniture acquisitions. Um, big kudos to Kathy and, and her staff on, on Getting us to the point where we have a mock-up day for, for staff to come out and look at, at uh, the new workstations, um, appliances, signages and weight finding, AV equipment, community hub, staff move plans. Uh, so there's a lot, a lot going on. There's a lot going on on the site, but there's also a lot going on behind the scenes, behind the scenes to make sure that when we get there, we're ready for it. Good. Exciting. Okay. That's it. Any questions? Well, well, thanks, Brent, for the update. And um, I'm going to move in a seconder that the presentation uh, material central admin building update April 19th or April 2019, date April 16th, 2019, be received as information. Councilor Shirton, Delamani. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. Yeah. Thank you. So let's move to uh, Councillor Patterson, and uh, we'll get through your uh, section just before lunch. Sounds good. Excuse me. Oh. Is there? You had nothing on other. We didn't finish up. Is there anything on other that you had? I don't think so. But I thought and that's where we left off. Engineering Capital Works. No, I have. Okay. Is there any okay other good. Business? Sorry. I guess oh. knew where we finished. Okay. So can, can I move along the agenda now? Yeah, but I just thought we didn't cover that. So that's where we should be. So. There was nothing under other. 
I know you churn for the Leafs to me, the Bruins. There's going to be some head to head here, and that was just an opportunity to comment. Yeah. That was a cross check to the face. That was what you just got. I'm just waiting for the cue to speak. Would it right. be appropriate? All right. <laughs> so moving on to report FIN 05 219 to do with assessments, uh, tax adjustments from properties. Recommendations are found on page 141. The report goes to page 144. I'm just going to read out the recommendation and then hopefully we have a mover and a seconder to get it on the floor. The report FIN-05-2019 applications for assessment of tax adjustments as of March of this year be received and that adjustment of taxes in accordance with sections 357, 358 and 359 of the Municipal Act be approved the amount of $1,848.34 as detailed in attachment one, which is on page 144. And there's eight properties in questions. They all fall under section 357 of the act. They're to do with either fire, houses being demolished, or wind damage. So can I have a remover to receive the report? Councillor Corbett, seconded by Councillor Lawrence. Any questions to it? Councillor uh, Corbett? Speak about that tornado that went through and ripped a part of the barn. Uh, and through the chair, um, I'm not sure exactly the exact nature of the storm that took it down. They, these come from their applications, so the applicants thought they had a tornado. Um, ultimately, the, there was a destruction of a piece of property, and then, then they are eligible under the program. But uh, whether there was an actual tornado that went through or not, uh, it, the end result is, is there's, there's a structure that's been removed, and they're eligible for reduction. Thank you. Any other questions to staff? Seeing none, can I call a vote? All in favor to accept the report? Down hands. Carried. Thank you. I'll ask uh, Mark, is, do you have anything else under business? Because when I don't ask you, you always have something else under business. <laughs> <laughs> this time through the chair, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that's all I have. Moving on to <laughs> Councillor Lawrence. Uh -huh. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Uh, so we have here. GVL-01-2019 emergency plumbing repair expenditure on page 145. We could have a mover and a seconder. Moved by Councillor Patterson, second by Councillor Delmani. Discussion? Okay, no discussion. I that uh, move that the recommendations that report GVL-01-2019 <laughs> emergency plumbing repair expenditure be received and that the emergency purchase outline and report GVL-01-2019 be funded from the capital replacement reserve generally in the amount of $30,000, $530 including non-rebatable HST. All those in favor? Carried Great unanimously. Question. Next to... And Oh, sorry, Councillor Shurton. I'm um, seeing that uh, the CEO of Grandview's here. My understanding there was a new uh, hiring in the last few days. I thought maybe she could maybe announce that. <laughs> <laughs> How you like that one, Mary? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I thought you vacated this seat. <laughs> I just my only question right now: Who is the mayor? <laughs> <laughs> well, she, she hurried to get here. We should at least ask her a question. All right. That's nope. what I was trying to. No, nope. please. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, through the mayor, we did just recently hire a new uh, facility supervisor. Um, we will send out the memo. We've had several recent new hires at Grandview Lodge, um, with the program supervisor being the last. Um, so the memo will come out to council introducing all three of the new hires all at once. Um, but the successful candidate was Kelvin Mowat from Dunville. Hey, thanks. thanks. Fantastic. <laughs> and I know him. Huh. Anything else, Councillor Shurton? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, moving on to LSS. Dash 05 2019 Farm Crossings over County Property. Did, um, we, did, did we actually vote on the last yeah, one? Yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah. Did we? Okay, sorry. 
Unanimous. It's all right. I voted for you. Thank you. Two <laughs> hands up. I was so thrown, I just wasn't sure what went on there. All good. Shall I continue on page 148? If we could have a mover and seconder to accept. Councillor Corbett to move it. Councillor Metcalf to second. Discussion? Councillor Damani? Chair, just one question. Um, obviously, this is um, trails are affected here, right? Like we're talking areas where, where the county has trails as well as other situations. But when, when we talk about the cost to the landowner, to the farmers that have traditionally had these rights away. We're not talking about anything significant here, are we, in terms of cost to them? Like, it's pretty minimal? It is. Okay. It's a, the application fee, which is a, about $224 this year. Um, and then um, we did have a public meeting where some of the uh, abutting owners did come out. We provided them with the license agreement and showed them the insurance requirement for that. So we don't believe that there will be any additional costs, or if, if there is, it would be very minimal. Okay, thank you. Councilor Shirton. Um, through the chair. Sandra, is it because these properties may be landlocked or is this just the easiest access for them to use this, these right of ways? For generally speaking, these properties are landlocked or there is no feasible, other feasible access. So there would be like a stream or something that runs through them. So there would be legal access. But I think for the majority of these cases, the properties are already landlocked and the only, the only way to get through it is to cross over the county trail. Okay. Any more discussion? <coughs> okay. Um, the recommendations that report LSS-05 2019 farm crossings over county property be received and that a bylaw to delegate authority to the manager of community development and partnerships division and the manager of legal and support services division jointly to enter into agreements for existing farm crossings over county owned prop lands for farming related activities be presented for enactment and that the mayor and clerk be authorized to execute all necessary documents required to give effect to the intention herein. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Okay, next, LSS-06-2019 road closure and conveyance of par part of Moray Street, Caledonia, page 156. Can I have a mover and a seconder? Councillor Patterson to move it. Councillor Shirt in a second. Discussion? Pretty straightforward. Uh, if anybody's unaware of, I'll speak on that, that it's just a piece of property between the river and back of a property. People want to purchase it, makes sense. They're going to be accessible. No, not accessible. So. Anyways, okay, so that report, uh, no more discussion, that report LSS-06-2019 <coughs> road closure and convenience of part of Moray Street, Caledonia be received and that the pin number 38174-0077LT being part of Moray Street, plan of the town of Caledonia designated as part two on 18R-4406 Haldeman County be stopped up closed and declared surplus to all county needs. And that the pin number 38174-0077LT being part of Moray Street, plan of town of Caledonia, designated as part two on 18R-4406 Haldeman County, be sold to the abutting property owner, Marcia Joanne Salt, for the purchase price of 46500 plus HST, and all costs of closure and conveyance conditional on the property merging with the existing lands owned by Ms. Salt. And that the public notice of the proposed closure and conveyance be published for one week in the local newspaper. And that a bylaw be passed to authorize the closure and conveyance. And that the mayor and clerk be authorized to execute all necessary documents. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. <coughs> Next, LSS-08-2019 road closure and conveyance of part of Haldeman Road 17, Dunville, on page 160. Do I have a mover? Councillor Delmani, the seconder. <coughs> Councillor Corbett, discussion? Councillor Corbett? Yeah, I understand with regard to the purchase of this property as buyer beware, there's no guarantee of 
building on it, but I'm concerned in terms of the uh, the line that goes along there that would indicate if you put this forward, then there's no opportunity for others along there to purchase to uh, make the line more consistent. Do you see what I'm talking about? Or? Um, through the chair, that's not the case for this here. This, the property, um, as illustrated in the attachment, <clears throat> is just lining up and it's going to make the road boundary straight across. Uh, I it's, the GIS is a little bit off in this case. There are no jogs. It actually, we had the survey, the draft survey indicates that the property line, the road boundary will not be jogging at all. It will be going straight across. Oh, if I may, yes. so that top yeah. yellow line goes above that other white line um that's it kind of goes on an angle a little bit but it does not there's no jog here at all the Could sketch be more see i'm looking at it here i'm looking at a jog about uh, i don't know 20 30 yards is that the case? It, it kind of goes from that corner <clears throat> the property boundary so the most northeasterly boundary to the most northwesterly boundary of the other property so what you're saying there's no further opportunity for anybody no, no there is not because that's where the line for the okay. that's correct the gis mapping is a little bit off as it is in certain places well it seems like it's a quite a bit, a bit off. more off any more discussion questions Okay, that the report LSS-08-2019 road closure and conveyance of part of Haldeman Road 17 Dunville be received and that the subject road allowance as shown in yellow on attachment number one to LSS-08-2019 and legally described as part of pin number 38136-0094LT being part of lot three Dostetter tract Canborough STCB 5240 <clears throat> Haldeman County be closed and declared surplus to all county needs and that the subject road allowance as shown in yellow on attachment number one to LSS-08 2019 and the legally described as part of pin number 38136-0094LT being part of lot three Dostetter track Canborough STCB 240 Haldeman County be sold to the abutting owner Audrey Ward Glenny for a purchase price of $750 plus <coughs> HST plus costs of the closure and conveyance and the easements be given for existing infrastructure and that the public notice of the proposed closure and conveyance be given and that a bylaw be passed to authorize the closure and conveyance and that the mayor and clerk be authorized to execute all necessary documents. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Next, LSS-09-2019-835 Sandy Bay Road, Dunville, encroachments on page 165. Do I have a mover for discussion? Councillor Shurton, seconder, Councillor Corbett. Discussion, questions? Pretty straightforward. Okay, so that report LSS-09-2019-835 Sandy Bay Road, Dunville encroachments be received and that an encroachment agreement be entered into for the land shown in yellow on attachment number one to LSS-09-2019 to allow for the continuance of the encroachments of the gravel driveway and part of the rock wall onto the abutting of road allowances owned by Haldeman County and that the subject road allowances as shown in red on attachment <coughs> one to LSS-09-219 and legally described as follows, be closed and declared surplus to all county needs. Part of pin number 38128-0051LT, part of the road allowance between <coughs> lots 12 and 13. Concession five south of Dover Road, Haldeman County, and part of pin number 3812 28-0263LT, part of lot 13, concession five, <coughs> south of Dover Road, Haldeman County. And that the subject road allowances are shown in red on attachment number one to LSS-09-2019 and legally described as part of pin number 38128-0051LT, part of the road allowance between lots 12 and, and 13, 
concession 5 south of Dover Road, Haldeman County, and part of pin number 38128-20263LT, part of lot 13, concession 5 south of Dover Road, Haldeman County, be sold to the abutting owner, Joseph Brennan, for a purchase price of $2,475 plus HST, plus cost of the closure and conveyance and that the public notice of the proposed closure and conveyance be given, and that a bylaw be passed to authorize a closure and conveyance, and that the mayor and clerk be authorized to execute all necessary documents to give effect the uh, intention herein. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. So if I can just speak to this last item here, there is a delegation who wishes to speak to this. So there is a motion to allow that after the lunch break. Uh, there is also is a closed memo that relates to it. So this should come back afterwards. After, yeah. Councilor Patterson? Yeah, can I just uh, make a comment to your last, I know we voted on it, but just the, the three properties in question, is that appropriate to make a comment or are we done chatting? Uh, under other business. Okay. Um, just for staff, it's just a request. I have no ob objection to the, to the last three we discussed, and it might just be myself or it could be other council members. At a future date, if it's possible to bring back some rationale on how we figure out the costing of these different parcels, uh, because they make no rhyme or reason to me as far as so <laughs> we, we go by that value chart or something that we can look at to make a reference, because in my simple mind, if, if an acre's works worth X amount of dollars and you know a tenth of an acre is worth this there's we're all over the map I realize there's different reasons whether it's landlocked or whatever but if, if I can ask staff to come back with something that I can look at and say yep that makes sense thank you Councilor Corbett yeah it's not in camera business but I see a lot of reasons why we shouldn't be selling this property and I'm I understand from what you're saying we're going in camera to discuss that is that the case there's additional information within the closed memorandum for council to consider before the open port report comes forward I'm, I'm just trying to <coughs> rationalize we're looking at selling but we're st some staff are saying we don't should sell it so uh, councillor Corbett um, you're on to the next report and uh, really the what the deputy clerk was saying is that there's an individual who wants to speak at one o'clock and so we really shouldn't consider it until we've dealt with that so at this stage the suggestion is we break for lunch and then deal with this after the break and i have no problem i just wanted to rationalize in my head what's going on here <coughs> And through, the chair, a through the chair, if I can address Councillor Patterson's um, question. Um, we do have, we have developed th um, in uh, conjunction with a local realtor, what's called the, the county's vacant land uh, chart. So um, there is, I, I, it was provided to council, I believe, in the past, and there are different categories within that. Um, it does, it is a confidential document, so it's not available publicly, but it's something that we use. And um, there's all kinds of different scenarios, different um, categories for the land as well. And I can provide that to council. That's at a request. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, with that, we'll, uh, unless Councilor Shirton has something else to add to the agenda, we'll break for lunch. Give his permission. Reconvene at one. So I guess we're good to go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
And uh, I'll let the clerk speak to how this process goes with the next presentation. Okay, so the first item pertains to uh, a matter under the, the Development Charges Act. So after the presentation, the floor will be open for anyone from the public wishing to speak to the matter to come up. So with that, uh, Gary uh, Scanlon's here with uh, Watson Associates. Uh, it's page 196 in the agenda. Looks like your last public meeting didn't go so successful, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> you can adjust if you need to the 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 height of that if it's uh, if i go to stand it's uh, probably better at a higher level for me. Okay. Yeah. if i fall down i'll just take okay. a momentary pause so. so it's a pleasure to be before you um the uh we've provided um uh, uh an overview presentation uh as you're aware, we've, um, with the Development Charges Act, there's a process we go through, prepare a background study, which must be circulated a minimum 60 days prior to uh, the first time council can consider the bylaw. So we've met all of those uh, uh, provisions, and I'll, I'll, I'll recap them in a moment once again. But this is to uh, basically overview the information that's contained in that background study. Uh, the clerk's noted uh, format for a public meeting, which is basically the same as any other public meeting. Uh, this is a mandatory requirement under the Development Charges Act. Uh, no decisions will be made today. It'll just be to receive input from, uh, from the public with respect to the proposed policies and the charges. <clears throat> There's a process. Uh, you've, we've presented this to yourselves as well as to uh, stakeholders. We've initiated the, um, the process last year in the fall and have been proceeding through in order to uh, undertake the calculations of the charge. We were before council in January and then in uh, March we released the background study and in March 21st we had a uh, discussion with the stakeholders on the proposed charges. Um, today, public meeting and subsequent to this, council can consider the, the bylaw. Um, we're looking to approve the bylaw by May 13th of this year. Development charges have been around for 60 years, so there's, um, they're fairly uh, straightforward. Um, there was, in the 1989 Development Charges Act was the first time, it used to be under the Planning Act. They put the Development Charges Act in place in 1989. And since that point in time, there have been uh, various changes. It's to recover the growth-related capital costs associated with residential and non-residential development within the, uh, the municipality. The, uh, the act lays out that there's basically two forms of, of costs. One cost is very localized, so that would be the works associated with specific developments, so water mains, sewers, roads, which may be internal, and some of the, um, the services that are external to that development. And then the development charge provides for the broader cost uh, that would be included and in cost shared amongst a number of different uh, users. So um, the uh, 1989 was when the first act came out. As I've noted, there's been uh, changes since then. In 1997, they removed a number of services, so development charges are not full cost recovery for the municipality. You can see there's a number of areas here where we cannot collect uh, the charges. Those would then have to be picked up. Those costs would have to be picked up from the property uh, taxpayer. Simply put, the charges start with identifying the amount, type, and location of growth. With that growth, we identify the servicing needs, and the servicing needs translate into capital projects. There are a number of deductions that we make, uh, that we must make as per the, um, the act, and then we end up with the net cost, which is then allocated between residential and non-residential development, and then we basically divide it back by the, the growth. The charge for residential is normally expressed on a low, medium, and high density, so a single and semi-detached townhouse and apartment uh, types of charges. And then non-residential is normally expressed on a cost per square foot basis. And very simply put, graphically, we identify the infrastructure <coughs> with the, all of the net deductions and such, divided by the growth, and that's how we come up with the, uh, the charges we put into place. 
The most recent adjustment to the Act was made uh, at the end of 2015, and at that particular point, there was some adjustments that have affected uh, the, the county. Um, there's a provision, they've called it uh, in the, um, the Act, they've talked about no additional levies. What it basically is, is that uh, we have to be clear on what costs the developers will pay as more of that localized cost, you know, the internal to the subdivision or the costs that are within the, the direct area. And under the Act, they call that local services. So we have to have a local service policy to clearly express what the developer's responsibilities are, 100% for the cost, and then what we're going to include in the development charge. Now you had that policy last time around when you passed your bylaw. We've gone with staff just to um, review it and be a little bit more expressed in what's contained in that document. So that's provided in an appendix to this study. Uh, annual reporting requirements have been modified just to provide a little bit more transparency. Um, uh, your your uh, finance staff have been conforming to this since 2016. Background study, as I've noted, must be made available now at least 60 days before you consider the bylaw. So they wanted to ensure there was more time for the public to uh, review the document and to provide their comments. Waste diversion, or actually um, all of solid waste, was removed <coughs> as a uh, eligible service, but they've added back in waste diversion. So recycle, reuse, organics, those type of things are now allowed for. We have included that this time around in the development charge calculations. And then lastly, it's just a consideration of area rating. Um, area rating or doing area specific charges normally work very well for water, wastewater and storm, uh, but they don't work very well for any of the other services because of other constraints that are within the act. We have provided charges that are basically um, payable within the urban area, but not the rural area and that's for those harder services, as I say. There are mandatory exemptions and discretionary exemptions. The mandatory aren't extensive, but if you have a, in, in, an existing industrial building, it can expand it by 50% without having to pay a charge. <clears throat> if you've got a single family home, you can add two additional apartments, as long as you don't more than double the house. And if you've got a, a townhouse complex or an apartment complex, you can add one additional unit without paying a charge once again. The last point just identifies that within the local government sector, you don't impose charges against upper, lower tier, or school boards. Now, you're a single tier, but still you wouldn't impose a charge against the uh, school boards for any buildings they build. Correspondingly, uh, if they have charges that they would put into place, you wouldn't pay for them as well. And then the, there's discretionary exemptions. So this is where you as a council refine the bylaw in order to either custom tailor the charge based on the type of uh, development that's occurring, say a church, or class of development, say industrial. If the charge is going up considerably, you could phase it in over time, uh, allow the development community a little bit of time to react to the new charges. Uh, so that's an option. And then the last one just talks about redevelopment credit, and it's, it's something which has actually arisen through case law. And just recognize that, that if I knock down a single family home and replace it, I should get a credit for what was there. If I knock down three single family homes and build t 10 townhouses, I would pay the 10 times the townhouse charge, subtract three times the uh, single family. So it's just to recognize it's a replacement for what was there. But these uh, particular policies, 95% of Ontario, limit them to either a four or a five year planning horizon in which to uh, receive that, uh, that credit. So currently, what's in your bylaw, which we would be looking to continue, is that uh, places of worship would uh, continue. So those uh, uh, buildings and, and spaces that are tax exempt under the Assessment Act uh, for place of worship would get the exemption. Uh, bonafide uh, farm buildings would be um, uh, exempted as well. Other things, uh, redevelopment, you provide that replacement for up to 10 <coughs> years to recognize uh, the demolition. As I say, 
95% of uh, Ontario does four to five years, you provide a little bit longer uh, planning horizon, and there are others that uh, are similar to you. It's timing of payment, it's at the time of building permit, um, and then you do provide for indexing of the uh, development charge uh, <coughs> annually. The local service policy, once again, I, this just reaffirms that uh, there were changes to the legislation. Uh, it basically uh, um, identifies that local services related to a plan or subdivision are the, the developing landowner's responsibility. So that's where we've, in, we've expanded on that policy and expressed it in more detail, and that's contained within the, the background study. Housing forecast, as you can see, <clears throat> historically the black indicates where the municipality has been, uh, trending in and around 100 units per year, but over the last couple of years you've experienced considerable growth. Uh, the forward forecast is looking in the range of um, you know, two, 225 up to 300 units per year. The color coding just denotes that the, the dark blue is uh, singles, the medium blue is um, uh, townhouses, and then the high density is represented in, by the, uh, the orangey color. <clears throat> Translating that into, <coughs> into units, you can see over the 10 years, about 2,700 units, which would translate into a population of about 6,400 people, and over the 20 years, about 5,600 units, which is about 13,000 people. And we've also provided for the <coughs> non-residential square footage associated with those time horizons. The current charges, as you can see, all of the different uh, services are identified on the left-hand side. Um, the first category of uh, services uh, leading down to where it says total municipal-wide services, that $8,200 charge currently is imposed anywhere within the municipality. So if you're in the rural area, you would pay that charge. If you're within an urban area, you still pay for those services. However, if you're in the urban area where you receive water and wastewater services by the municipality and, and storm, then there'd be an extra $3,900 charge. So that's for the, the treatment facilities that you provide to uh, take care of the water going into the unit and the sewage effluent coming out. So totaling that together in the urban area, the charge would be about 12,100 for a single detached. As we move down, you can see multiples, which is uh, the fourth column. That's your townhouse, your medium density, it's at about 10,500, and then we've got two categories for um, apartments. Non-residential on a square foot basis is $3.07. For the most part, we've uh, continued with the same services, but we have added waste diversion. <clears throat> when we take a look at the calculated charges, they're updated to being a municipal wide of 14,200. Um, <clears throat> the urban service, so the water wastewater storm charge, is now $6,863. So in total, the charge would be 14,000 for the uh, single detached for the rural area and 21,000 for the urban. <coughs> the corresponding charges for other multiples, which is your medium density, and then the apartments is represented here as well. Uh, the non-residential is um, fully serviced is at $4.72. And if we compare the charges, you can see here service by service where the changes have been, <coughs> excuse me, uh, been a charge a change uh, in um, the indoor and outdoor rec uh, is a larger component of the, the increase. You can see that's increased by over $4,000 and to some extent a larger increase in, in um, road related works. Uh, the water and the wastewater obviously as well have increased. Uh, oops. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, on the non-residential side, similar type of charge. Uh, uh, comparison, you can see the uh, municipal wide has not changed too much on the non-residential, but the <coughs> increase is on the water and the wastewater side. Just comparing other jurisdictions, you can see that uh, we've included um, uh, a number of municipalities from Niagara. We've included Guelph, Hamilton, Milton, Burlington, Pelham, a number of different uh, comparators. So you can see currently the black uh, arrow represents your current charge for residential. 
The green is the proposed charge. So you're still at the far end of the, uh, the scale in this, uh, this particular survey. If we take a look at uh, commercial development, you can see once again uh, you're at the low end of that uh, schedule. And then when we take a look at industrial, similarly the charges are at the uh, same positioning uh, as <coughs> the prior slide. So that concludes my presentation. This is just to identify that um, the bylaw will be considered by Council on May 13th. May 7th will be uh, a, a time when Council can discuss further the policies and the charges to give us some direction for the final bylaw adoption. Okay, thanks Gary. Uh, questions to Gary? <coughs> Councilor Sheridan. Um, through the Mayor, Gary, uh, going back a few slides, um, I know in the building uh, field, there's a few feel that this big increase is going to make impact them. Can you just explain how the phase-in would work, and would that have an impact on us as a county, or how would that work? Um, yes, I'd be happy uh, to answer that through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, if you phase in the charge, uh, we've calculated a full cost recovery charge for related to the services. If you decide to phase it in, let's say um, to, um, keep, for example, if you kept the charges at the current rates to at least the end of the year so that you're putting them in place for the next building season, then any building permits that would be taken out, the loss, um, loss of revenue between our calculated and your current would be something that we would then have to fund in, uh, through your next year's operating budget. So, so the, any of the non-collections have to be paid for in some way. So it would be an impact on the county yes. to do that. Okay, I just wasn't sure how it would work and how it would look. Gary, on that, could you phase it mm -hmm. in where you pick up the, the difference, at a, at, for instance, mm -hmm. next year, so you inflate it to pick up the loss of this year's? There's a provision in the Act that talks about cross-subsidization, which basically means if you don't collect off of one collective or at least one time horizon, you can't put it on the backs of others to, to basically pick up that subsidy. So right. it's just to recognize you're, you have full control over your policies, but when you don't collect, it's something that has to be funded. Obviously, if you got a million dollar water main and we say we're recovering 100%, if you start to collect less than the 100%, there's a shortfall and that has to be picked up. Right, okay. Anything else for Gary? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. It's good. And so, okay. So since this is a this is a public meeting, and uh, if there's anyone that uh, that wanted to speak uh, uh, with respect to the presentation that Gary's made or with the uh, development charges, you're you're welcome to approach. Uh, if you do want to speak, just uh, if you wouldn't mind signing in and. Uh, and introducing yourself, that would be wonderful. Okay, Laird. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I have a lot of issues with the development charges, the way they stand. Uh, I guess the biggest one is the increase. We're not very comparable to our, our nearest neighbor, which is Norfolk. Uh, they had an increase, which was minimal. They had the same problem, to my understanding. Uh, the rates were going to skyrocket. They addressed it. They brought them back in line. I think we need to be somewhere in the same neighborhood as our competition. I went through some of the paperwork. I understand where the charges are coming for wastewater and sewers, or and water and sewers, but uh, I don't understand some of the recreational end. Like 
the number I come up with was a 118% increase for outdoor buildings, arenas, pools, stuff like this. Like how can, how can council justify 118% increase on these type items than approximately 50 or 60% on water and wastewater. So, and uh, I guess that's all I got to say. So I don't know if council can address it, how, how they justify it. Uh, well, I, is there any questions to Laird specifically? Um, I think Laird, the, the, it, what was tasked really was to to give Gary and company uh, the the function to go out and, and and take all the information and make that presentation, and that, that's kind of what's happened. We've gone through the initial meeting that we had here a month and a half ago or so. And then they had a public meeting, which I think you were at. Um, and then here we are again today. So it wasn't so much uh, uh, marching orders per se, other than there are some capital, uh, as you mentioned, water, wastewater issues that we do have across the county that, that need to be addressed within the development charges. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was really, you know, taking, taking sort of the, the initial direction as to Here's where we're at. Here's where we're, we're the pressures that we're we're, we're anticipating, and uh, and so Gary, with uh, his work, has been able to bring that back. Uh, this has not been decided on, as you know, and uh, and so I don't uh, I don't think anyone specifically in council has said uh, they're looking for a, a a a number, if you will. It's uh, it's it's encompassing all of the issues that uh, the county has faced, and so that's that's what we're wrestling and grappling with as to how do we how do we achieve the, the goal of making sure that we can <coughs> provide those services, uh, whether it's recreational or whether it's the water wastewater, and and not have it fall sorely on the uh, the current and existing tax base? I guess the one other big problem I have with it is the way it's circulated to the people that are affected. If I do a project, I, I nail up a yellow sign and say, look, and I send letters to all the neighboring people that are are directly affected the people that are directly affected from from this aren't even notified the builders and the people like this they should have been all formally notified of these changes because they're directly affected and they're not if they don't see it in a newspaper or someplace like this they're not even aware of it so that's why you're not getting a lot of response and a lot of turnout for some of these meetings because they're unaware of it. I, w I was unaware of it till I was at our meeting. Then I become aware of it. I don't sit and read all the articles on Haldeman County in the newspaper every week to see what's going on. Yeah. I've, I've got other things to do. But, but I, I'm, I'm certain that you've been, you, you've been in the building business long enough. You're aware that we do go through this DC charge process on a on an every four or five year basis. And, oh, uh, and yeah. so I realize that I think the, the, from my understanding, the, the majority of those that have been in it, uh, certainly know that this was coming. It's, I don't think anybody could say that they knew that there would be an increase that, uh, that they were expecting. And, and that's a fair, mm -hmm. fair statement to make. Well, everybody's realized, I've realized everything is coming. Death yeah. is coming, yeah. <laughs> but I don't know when it's going to be. Right. And the same as this. I'm not aware of the date you're going to have public meetings and, and where all these things are going to be. I'm not aware that you're trying to lay a 75% increase across the board on development fees. Like, I, th I think that's very unreasonable. I, th I don't think it's fair to the builders. I don't think it's fair to the people purchasing the houses. I look at the charges that you charge the developers now we do park dedication, we do this, we do trails, we do everything else, and that's all put on the price of the homes in the first place. So that's something they're paying for. Now you add another $9,000 on top of this again, like on top of your 12. I think it's, it's unreasonable. Well, and I, I understand, Larry, but I guess I would argue and say that, you know, and I know Norfolk might be different, but, but if we look over towards Grimsby and Bimbrook and, and Mount Hope area, those houses are, are comparable to the houses being sold in, in Haldeman with a three times development charge. Yeah, but what, what region are they dealing with? They're dealing with Hamilton? They're, they're, 
But yeah. the, as far as the purchaser, the purchaser is paying the same price on a product and built into that price is, is a $30,000 development charge versus a, a, a twelve, fifteen, dollars or $18,000 charge. Yeah, you can say that for Caledonia and Benbrook and, and these places, but what about Jarvis and Selkirk and the rural areas, the farther you push south, right. the lower the price scale is on the houses. So a guy buying a $400,000 house in Jarvis may be comparable with a $600,000 one in Caledonia, and he's buying in Jarvis because that's all he can afford. But he, in turn, is paying 21000 development charges. Right. So I don't know. I, I, think it's, I think it's too big an increase, too fast. I think... Uh, some of the wish list on, at the development end, I know you have to have infrastructure. Infrastructure is a necessity for growth. I, I, and I can see that those increases in place. It's just some of the other ones I see that are like this 118%. It's, it's unheard of, so okay. anyway. No, I appreciate the comments and, I, and I'm sure counsel. Any questions to Laird? I know that Councilor Patterson. Uh, not a comment to Laird. I just want, as far as my fellow councillors, to be aware, and I'm not putting words in your mouth, so um, I was at the stakeholders meeting about three weeks ago. Uh, there was Mr. McKean, there was a builder, and there was a real estate gentleman there. And the question, I guess, that hasn't come out yet, <clears throat> and that was asked of staff three weeks ago, is it possible, none of the people in the room seem to have a difficulty with the increase in the charges. They knew it was necessary for what we want to do. The question was, can it be phased in over three or four years? Um, $9,000 is too hard for me to calculate, so let's say it's 1000 bucks. Instead of paying $200 each year, maybe they pay 250 or $300. They pay for that increase in interest or the funds that the county is going to, to lose, but make it more bearable for <coughs> the developer or the builder, and they also don't have to unload that entire cost to the general public that's buying the house. So I'm just wondering if staff can comment on that. Is that a possibility? I know we, we've seen up here that it can be phased in. I don't know if that can be phased in over a year, can it be phased in over four or five years, or do we have that capability already, I guess, if the developer requests that service? Uh, <clears throat> through your worship, and I guess there's sort of two components to that, I guess, as I see it. Uh, the phasing in, I think Gary spoke to, is we, we phase in the rates, i.e., or less than what we've calculated, then uh, the rest of the taxpayers would have to pick up any difference between what we collected and what we should have collected. So there's a there's a tax impact on on phasing it in. Uh, we do have uh, the municipality does have a deferral program, so the deferral program allows, uh, and there is certain conditions under the current deferral program that allows to defer the payments over a period of time, <coughs> up to a maximum of five years. Typically, is a is our current conditions, it has to be a, a medium to large scale subdivision development that's happening in phases, and you could pay it over time. However, you would still pay the same DC fee, it just you would pay it over time with interest. So uh, you, in theory, you would still be passing that on to, uh, to, to the ultimate homeowner in that regard. So there, there is the ability to do it. Uh, I mean, there's implications, financial implications to either the county and or the developer under any of those scenarios. Uh, thank you for that, and that was the answer to the question I think that was asked three weeks ago. Yeah, but that's that's not a very good answer. That's still the same price. It's just deferred down the road to the same house, and so, the developer developer doesn't pay for it anyway. The builder pays for it when he picks up the building permit. So, uh, at the end of the day, the homeowner is still going to pay it. So I, I just I just think we yeah. need to find a way to. So I think I leave you with this, Laird. Is that? Today, you're, you're, you're making the comments, and I know staff's taking down the notes as well as we are. Uh, ultimately, there's no decision that's, that's going to be made until May the 6th? 7th. 7th? May 7th. So, so I think in, in, in you know, not trying to plan on the fly or, or, or come up with a, a, an answer that's going to, to get us to ultimately where we need to be, but I think what, you're, what, what today is for is the opportunity for you to stand and be able to, to express yourself so that we can take that information, give it back to the staff and, and go back to, to the drawing board to some degree and find something that, that is pa compatible and that will s solve the issues that we need to solve. We may not get ultimately to where you want to be, but we might be able to improve upon where we are today. And so I think that's, that's part of this whole process. <coughs> 
Okay. I'd, I'd, I'd like to see it closer to Norfolk uh, because we are competing directly with Norfolk. But I know it's a different animal. But well, I think but in, in, in fairness, that's the problem is that I think if you take the county, we're, we're competing with three entities. I mean, you take Dunville, they're competing with the, the Niagara, uh, you know, sort of region. And then you take Caledonia, it's competing with Hamilton. You're competing with Norfolk. And, and they're all completely different uh, markets. And so it does make it a challenge for us trying to come up with a, a number that is appropriate that, that captures all of those three three marketplaces and provides the services that we need to provide. Just put in three development charges to get free share again. <laughs> Don't do a fair, we'll lower down uh, one for Jarvis and raise up Caledonia and Dunville. Yeah. Oh yeah, that'll go over real well. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, come down and Dunville and sell yeah. that. You got a question for Laird or? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, we had a previous discussion with Gary, and I understand that the comment was that residential development doesn't pay for itself, and that's what I'm looking at. But you made some comments with regard to the comparison of uh, development charges between Norfolk, and I'm trying to rationalize it with the, the information, the bar graphs I got here, which would indicate uh, Norfolk County is current, uh, Holloman County is, is uh, calculated. Is Norfolk coming up uh, addressing this issue now where they might be leapfrogging as well and all those other things I see that we're below. What, what, what is your reference to? Mine? It's charts. I'm, I'm looking at your charts and they're showing Norfolk at uh, uh, way below or, uh, Haldeman County. Right it says Haldeman County calculated. I assume is that that's what we're doing now. If you look back, it's Haldeman County current, and then I see Norfolk County current, which is above ours. Is Norfolk in the process of recalculating theirs? That's all I'm trying. Uh, to, does that, that does that that say proposed on Norfolk County? Yeah. Well, I don't know whether that's Norfolk County who's already done their development charges uh, study. I assuming it's right now and they <coughs> have to go through the process as well. We've just gone through the process and it's gone up, but these others have gone down. So I'm trying to get. Well, you got to ask somebody that from your staff or somebody that did the charts that, that knows better than I do because I'm just going by what I see there. And it says proposed, Norfolk County proposed. And uh, I take that that's either been passed or it's in the process of being passed at that number. That's, that's what my estimate is, so. Okay. Mark? So, your Worship, I, I, I'll answer that question just to, to, to reflect what's in the graph today. So as you can see on the, the right side, you have the, the current and current Haldeman in Norfolk and currently Haldeman is lower than Norfolk. The proposed Norfolk up in there is they're circulated, uh, so they're in the same sort of process we are right now. Uh, they've circulated the proposed what? rates and they're getting feedback on those rates currently. What's the, do you, because do you, I mean, that's kind of vague, that chart. What's the actual number of Norfolk? Do we know the number in comparison to Haldeman as it is existing today? Uh, three words, but I'll get to those in a minute. Okay. And then if I can get the same proposed number for Norfolk, against our numbers so that I can get the delta between the two. Any other questions for Laird? No? Thank you, Laird. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to? <coughs> we are on a time, time, well, we are on a time constraint. to me or is that? <laughs> 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 well, I'll take my time here. Yeah. <laughs> You can adjust that podium too if you like, because no, I'm you're okay. a little, little I'm okay. taller than uh, than the rest. There's. Uh, anyway, my uh, I'm Richard Schulster. If you don't know me, um, I dabble a little bit in real estate and whatever. Um, I guess my biggest bone of contention in all this is that um, it has to do with the recreation element of this proposal. So obviously council or somebody has directed our consultants to um, double the uh, recreation portion of the development which uh, if you look further it's a, a 14 million dollar hit that for some reason the development community has to pay for that and then um, there was a question asked by Rob I believe 
that if we don't phase it in, then we have to play catch up. But this $14 million, as far as I can see, is kind of a slush fund for something in the future. So I'm not sure how we would actually have to play catch up when it's, we're not catching up to anything because this is just a, a phantom facility because, I mean, we have our arenas, our new arenas in the county. We're doing pretty good, but there's $14 million in this development charge that I don't see how we would, how the development community, uh, community has to pay for that in one shot. And that's basically my concern. It's, that's $5,000 of that de new development charge. 50% of the increase is strictly for that $14 million facility. And we kind of all know in the back of our minds what that is, but that may never happen. So I don't know what would happen to that money if it never happens. Like, I don't know what the process is, but <coughs> it's, a, it's, a lot, it's, a, it's a big expense for something that might never happen. And I don't know how, how you guys as a county deal with that. Questions for Richard? Well, um, I guess my, I guess Richard, very valid point. Um, knowing what we've heard the last eight years about this potential indoor pool and whatever, <coughs> we have to have the ability, and we don't do it. These charges don't change every year. So if we were to put something on the books and build something in the next two years, not actually hit shovel in the ground, but we wouldn't have the ability, the, the potential indoor pool would be built with no development charge being raised. So I'm pretty confident around the table where the priorities went that something's gonna be decided and based on the development charges of being up for re, um, review, that's why I think this was presented. now. I don't know how that amount was chose. You're, you're right there. Um, whether we have the ability to adjust that down to 10 million as opposed to 14 million, I don't know. That's a question we can ask staff. And uh, but uh, very here, valid here, point that you made. Here's another question. So this 14 million dollar facility doesn't get built. We get our increase in development charges. So then, if it doesn't, so does that mean it's going to decrease because it's not being built? It's, it's, it's like we're kind of putting the cart before the horse or, you know, let's, you know, is there a decision? I, and I understand yeah. that monetarily you have to decide, do we have enough money to, to build this? But, but does it have to come from one sector only or, or does everybody in the community actually contribute to it instead of just the new people or the people that are building new properties or that have to pay for it? So I'm going to take a stab at a bit of that. I think it, the, the intent is that um, everybody will will participate to some capacity in, in supporting that. And, and what we have heard uh, across the county is, is, is that there are some forms of recreation that are lacking, whether it's a splash pad in, in Jarvis or an indoor pool in Dunville or a, uh, a soccer park or the different items. And so, so to simply say that you know, money's being earmarked for one specific item doesn't really mean that that's going to happen or not, but it's not, it doesn't mean the money will go away. It just, it just, it may change its face as to what it looks like. But the challenge is, is, as Rob said, is that if we don't put in place something to start capturing that, those funds today, then <clears throat> we're stuck with working backwards and not having the funds to be able to support putting anything in to, to, to drive the needs of the communities at that time. And so, so that's, it's, the, it's the cart for the horse, and I understand what you're, what you're saying is, you know, well, we don't actually have anything uh, in the 10-year capital today. Well, part of the reason we don't is because if we put it in the 10-year capital and we don't have the DCs to pay for it, then it hits the tax base. And so we have to find that, that, that medium ground. And I think, as I said to Laird, that's part of, I think, the discussions today is we've, we've lobbed one out there for you guys to, to, to catch and, and you're throwing it back at us. And so now we've got to come back and say, okay, what's that, what's that number? What does that look like that we can all buy into and, and it can all still drive good business at the same time enable us to properly plan for for those services down the road okay well 
I, I, I think I made my point. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. No. Thank you very much. Yeah. Councilor thank Corbett you. to to well, just to Richard on, on that comment. I'm sure we're taking into consideration the comments that are being made. Now I know we discussed it in a priority session, but when it come up to uh, getting these figures for the uh, recreation, that wasn't even thought of. So we must have some response from. The gentleman went out and did the study, and uh, where are we going from here? They're they're making the comments. What are we looking at? Responses from Gary on that, or? Yeah, I, I think from Craig's comments, I think staff staff is gathering that information. I, I think initially, as I say, Gary was putting together. This was this is this is what encompasses all of the the needs and sort of services that you had spoke of that we all had spoke of. So now staff will respond based on what they've received today, along with some, some, some more information to be able to come back to council with here's plan A, B, and C. And, and there will be some options that uh, council will have to, to, to make. Um, you know, and at that point, it'll be what, what, what are the important valuable services? I think it goes without saying that uh, Laird mentioned it, that water and wastewater are obviously first and foremost and, and and we can't we can't defer those those are things that we have to continue to invest in so that growth can continue to to survive but it's the it's not the wants it's those needs those other things on the list that are the the, the or sorry the wants that uh, that you know we may have to look at scaling back on and and then that means going back to the public and putting it on the public if it's something that they decide that they would really like to have then the public has to be willing to to put maybe more in the in the coffers to support it. Thank you. I don't want them to go away with the impression that we're amassing this money for a swimming pool. Yeah. It's a whole bunch of things that are out there. Well, yeah, that you're, yes, and I think there's more to that, as you say, than just the pool. But that answer is going to get back to them. Yes, and we are going to uh, find out as far as why. Uh, or how we circulate, you know, the information to our, our local builders and developers so that uh, uh, we can get that, that, that list and get that information out. Because I would have assumed that we would have gotten that information out that the DCs were being reviewed at uh, a period of time. Anyone else? <clears throat> Joyce Lennox, and um, I'm just representing <laughs> myself, okay. very small portion of the population. We'd like to build our own house. Um, here's the thing. Um, real estate has gone up, and because, like, we know what happened in Toronto, and that made real estate go up here. So, like, if a house was worth 300000 now it's worth six. So the builders know that, and so now... Um, buildings, builder home, build homes, cost as much as, you know, they're doubled too. The trades are getting rich, we know that. And I'm not complaining about that, we, I'm, I'm a trade myself. But if you're an owner builder, you're sort of caught between because, um, you know, you're gonna pay these high, you know, high fees for the trades, and now like $14,000 is a lot of money to put on top of that to build a house. And if Richard's right, um, I just don't think it's fair. I think that if you need the development fees, sure. But if it's to put it into something that we don't, haven't even identified yet, uh, I think it should be like everybody should pay. Like we're making houses less and less affordable. Like it's, it's a problem. It's a problem in Toronto. It's a problem here. Like how many people, you know, like can afford to pay twice as much for a house now, as they did a few years ago, um, do we want to encourage people to build, or are we trying to prevent them? It doesn't seem to me like um, loading up on development charges is going to help. Okay. Any other questions? I, 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 
I, I appreciate your points, but when I look at this graph, given this geographic area, I'm going to disagree with you and say that we're not loading up on development charges because, I mean, I'd say that we're very competitive. Uh, you know, we're, we're high in this go around based on what we've been, but, but I would argue and say we've been traditionally low because of the stunted growth that we had in, in Haldeman County from 2006. And had we had the growth that we should have had, you wouldn't be sitting here with this this number today at uh, 20,000. You would actually be coming from 20,000 because we would have had those incremental increases. And that's the challenge is that is getting us back to where we should have been had we not had that stunted growth, I think is, is what we're facing. And so whether we do it in an incremental way, uh, it's, it's something I think staff and, and, and council need to wrestle with. Uh, but in terms of being competitive, I'd still argue, based on the numbers that I see across uh, the region, we're very competitive in terms of DC charges. Just not only where we where we are, certainly where we are, we're the ultimate lowest, uh, but where we're heading, we're still at the bottom of that scale. Well, that's something else I disagree with because I don't think that we should charge things based on what everybody else is doing. Because, um, like, if we don't need it, then um, why are we doing it? Like, it, it doesn't seem right. Uh -huh. Because then everybody else will say, well, theirs are higher, theirs are higher, there's no end to it. It keeps going up just because everybody else is higher. Well, I, I, I don't think it's so much we're charging because they're charging. I think we're charging because the cost of those services are the same across the region and the needs of the, those, those people moving into those communities are the same. And so as those communities grow, those needs grow. And we've heard, as Councillor Corbett said, our, our, our standalone property taxes are not sustainable in terms of managing or maintaining the services that people require. So we do need to have a, de a development charge that is competitive and fair to be able to offset some of those costs. And, and I, I, I'm not suggesting that the number that's being proposed today should be the number, but what I'm saying is that I still believe we're, we're, we're very competitive marketplace. Well, that may be, but... <laughs> yeah. And we could agree to disagree. That's okay. We'll, we'll agree to disagree. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Anyone else want to? No. Mark. Uh, to your worship, I can give you those rates that was asked before. Between oh, the right. Comparison between yeah. Hollow and Norfolk. Uh, so the current rates uh, for a single-family dwelling unit, which this uh, graph depicts. For Haldeman currently is 12,125 and Norfolk's 14,052. And then uh, Norfolk's proposed rate is 17,206 and Haldeman County's is $21,063. So they're, we're going from 12,125 to 21,063 and Norfolk's proposing to go from 14 to 17,206. And uh, Norfolk's pretty much in the exact same position as far as approving the rates right now. I think they're public meetings uh, next week, so. Okay, thanks. Good, thank you for that. Anyone else need, wanted to speak? No? I got a Councilor Well, I got a question just through the mayor and just for the people that are in the audience. So, just so I'm clear, so we, we have this rate potentially set and we're gonna be discussing and debating it on May 7th and at that date other public um, builders have the ability to come and talk that date or should they have their input prior to that May 7th date? That's the question I'm asking. Three words if I may answer sort of from a process perspective and, and that is the purpose of today's meetings. Today meeting purpose is to get the public's input. So this is the last opportunity for public's input. What will happen is staff will bring that back with the report on May 7th and make recommendations to council. And I think as, as the mayor indicated, that can include a number of things, different options on how you want to address, if council wishes to address some of the, uh, the public input or not, and that's when that would happen. Uh, ultimately, we do have to have a bylaw passed by May 13th because our current bylaw expires the following week. Uh, in May, so um, you know it, it is still council's discretion to look at some of the different options to address the public feedback. That would happen on May 7th, but we won't accept any more public feedback on that day. Uh, that's today. Now we, we do have a, a methodology on our website as well for people to make comments. So we have been receiving comments uh, through email 
Uh, we had a, a, the stakeholder session back in March uh, that we did notify developers to come and attend, so we got a feedback from that as well. So we're, we're taking feedback, but by the time we write the May 7th report, uh, it will incorporate all of the feedback at that point in time. And, and if, I don't know if Craig wants to add to that. The only other thing I would add is that <clears throat> the staff report, as in any public report, will be made available before the meeting, and the people can always delegate on that report if they wish to speak to it. Sure. Okay. So just the email ability, if, if there's a few, like I can think of one or two that I probably would have been here if we would have known about this today. They have the ability to comment and via an email up until the end of the week, or what should I tell them? Three or worse, probably like two weeks from now, so we've got to set a deadline to start preparing sure. the report, and yeah. particularly if we're looking at options for council, we'll have to get those addressed sooner, sooner than later. Yeah, no, I to totally agree how we got to have a timeline, but I just wanted to be clear, so I, if I do mention it, that they have a chance to comment that I'm not over saying what can and can't happen. So just wanted some clarification. So thanks. Okay. Yeah. Um, just a comment. I, I think that we all have to agree here um, that the development charges need to go up. Um, they've, as Mayor Hewitt pointed out, they haven't gone up since 2006 for external forces. We need to play catch up. What they are, what that amount is, this is the great thing about democracy and everybody here has their opinion and and make their case um, we can all do that um, you know I've heard percentages uh, Laird said uh, like on one uh, point of view about 175 percent you know I could throw it could be said that nine thousand dollars on top of a four hundred thousand dollar home that's a 2.3 percent increase so we can talk about percentages and we can spin it off however we want but we need to play catch up here what that number is Yes, we need to decide, but definitely uh, it's great to hear voices, um, and we'll do that in the future. But I th really, realistically speaking, as a county, we, we need to increase them. And I just I fully support whatever that increase is. We can arrive at, but I think that we definitely have to all agree that there has to be some increase of some sort. Okay, well, I've got a motion here, and uh, I... I <clears throat> I think, I think it's important that, uh, that we leave you with the message that we've heard and, and, and we leave you with the message that it's important that we all find a way to work together and, and, and make this palatable so that it, it, uh, it ultimately serves 100% of our needs and we identify those wants that uh, I think the community would like to establish and, and, and find a way to get to that ultimate goal. So. It's, uh, it's been good information, and uh, I know that uh, our next report coming back from staff is going to be able to give us some, some further uh, ability to make a decision. I think that's both good for the developing world as well as for the public. So, uh, I need a mover and a seconder that the correspondence and presentation material from Watson Associates uh, development charges update and review of draft rates be received as information. Councillor Corbett and Councillor Midcalf. All in favor, that's carried unanimously. And so that will come back on May the 7th and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see, see, where it, uh, see what happens then at that time. We'll just take a quick couple minute break just to allow for us to change over to the next delegates.
So our, our delegations don't usually go that long, so sorry to you guys who had to enjoy that last hour of your time. Um, but uh, Ben Lafort, Lafort, is that right? Lafort, yeah. Lafort, okay. He's a senior farm analyst and uh, with Haldeman County Federation of Agriculture and is here to request to adjust the tax ratio policy. And you have a presentation to make, I guess? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to council and staff for having us here today. Appreciate the opportunity to discuss this issue, which has been uh, kind of um, progressing uh, over the last couple of years as we these MPAC assessments are phased in. Uh, I do want to take a moment to uh, quickly highlight the uh, economic contribution of farmers in the area. Unfortunately, Norfolk and Haldeman by Statistics Canada was lumped together, so it's difficult to quite separate them. But um, I suppose the positive side of, of tight margins for farmers means when they got money come in, they're spending it. They're spending it on labor and material and fuel, and all that has economic uh, spin-off throughout Ontario. Uh, so the Ministry of Agriculture has recently released new numbers, uh, county by county, and we didn't really have that county uh, level information from OMAFRA before about uh, the economic contributions of farms in Ontario. So the 2,150 farms between the two counties, uh, 800 million plus in, in farm cash receipts. Uh, so that's how much money is coming in, and about 86% of that goes right back out the door, uh, and that's where a lot of the economic spin-off uh, happens, and, and that uh, tr translates into about two and a half billion throughout the province of Ontario in provincial GDP contribution, and uh, supporting at 51,000 jobs throughout the uh, agri-food food chain in Ontario. So, uh, very happy to be able to highlight those numbers. Uh, that the, the real numbers that bring us here today are the uh, part of that, those numbers that are going out the door, which is uh, related to the MPAC assessments. Uh, so every four years, uh, MPAC, they redo their assessments. Um, they say, you know, here's what the uh, assessment change is for all property classes, for residential, commercial, industrial, farm. Um, and then those increases are phased in over a four-year period. Uh, so we're in the third year now of MPAC's four-year assessment cycle. Uh, the new assessment cycle will kick off in 2021, um, and I believe by the end of the year, MPAC should have an idea of what the assessment changes should look like for each property class, and, and I'm, I'm hoping that uh, the uh, change in, in assessment values are, are a little more closer together, because really what brings us here today is, is the in, not only the increase in, in the farm property assessment, um, but really what's driving it is the fact that the farm properties have increased at a much higher rate than other property classes. So on average in Haldeman County for this assessment cycle, farm uh, assessment values from MPAC have increased by about 53%. Uh, and that in itself isn't necessarily the problem, 53%. It's the fact that residential values, which is the largest property class, has only increased by four, uh, 15%. So if residential values had also increased by 53%, there, there wouldn't really be an issue. The issue becomes when one property class, their assessment value is, is increasing at a much faster rate than, than the other properties in the county. Um, so there'll be two things that are really going to determine the, the tax burden on any property class, and including farmers, is one is, is this right here, is how is the assessment value of farmland, how is that increasing relative to the other property classes? That's the one factor, and that's controlled by MPAC. None of us here have any control over that. Uh, the other fact would be then the, the tax ratio, and they can equally control this equation of, of you know, how much of the property tax burden is falling on one particular property class. So what we've been seeing is you know, the, the farmland assessments have increased at you know, nearly four times the rate of residential, and the, the tax ratio has remained the same, and, and as a result, each year, uh, a little bit more and a little bit more of your total uh, tax levy is coming from the farm property class, which is basically a fixed rate of, of the amount of uh, property owners and, and acres. Um, you know, we just had a, a very long discussion. Uh, we were sitting in on, on development charges and development in general. Um, I think that is another very distinguishing factor of the farm class is we can't build more farmland. Uh, so any increase on tax to, to the farm property class is falling on the same or fewer number of, of acres and the same or fewer number of farmers each year. Because uh, again, we, we can build new houses, we can build new commercial or industrial properties, but we can't make new farmland. We have a fixed amount and in fact, you know, we lose some to development each, each year. So when that tax increase uh, is, is uh, from these assessments is pushed on to farm property class, 
they don't have the luxury of, you know, now we have 200 additional units of farming. No, we have the same amount or, or particularly even less of that is being spread throughout. So before these assessments were phased in, um, around 3.6% of the total um, taxes from the county were being collected by uh, from farm properties by the end by next year if the ratio remains the same that'll be around five percent and um, if actually the problem goes back even further than this assessment cycle in the previous assessment cycle it was a little bit less dramatic but uh, starting in 2012 we see a significant increase year over year over year for eight straight years um, in the tax burden for farm properties so in 2012 you collected around 2.4 percent of your total taxes from farm properties and that is, you know, within range of where it had been. In, in 2001, um, it uh, was 2.56. It hovered around that, um, never really cracked 3% until 2012 on. It's, it's just been a significant increase year over year. And again, that's completely driven by the disproportional increase in assessments and the maintaining of, of the current 0 0.25 farm tax ratio. So what we're proposing then is, is to adjust the farm tax ratio in 2019 to kind of keep us where, where we were. So in, in 2018, you know, collecting around approximately 4.5% of, of the total tax levy from farm properties, rather than having that scooch closer to 5%, the proposal to adjust the farm tax ratio would, would keep that tax burden around 4.5%, um, recognizing that for the past six years, that, that number has increased year over year. Um, I already talked about that, about the, the tax ratio in general. So. Uh, just to reiterate that it can be adjusted, that farm tax ratio, anywhere between zero and 25% of the residential rate each year. So, uh, you know, it, it can be really any number that you decide. So we will put forward a, a number that we feel is fair that will kind of maintain that tax burden. But if there is a, a kind of another a number that the council finds more palatable, you have the ability to adjust that anywhere between zero and 25% every year. It's currently at the max at, at 25%. And given the assessments, that is, that's why our, our request has come forward to reduce that tax ratio slightly to, to prevent any more significant tax burden from falling onto farm properties. Um, obviously, this is not an isolated I issue in Haldeman County. Farm assessments across the board were significant in uh, 2016 assessment cycle. Uh, and that's on top of Southwest Ontario where there was a significant increase in 2012 as well. So we've been to a number of counties where the issue has been most severe, um, and a number of counties have um, now begun um, uh, adjusting that farm tax ratio. Uh, not on here would be, I don't think it is here, no, because it just happened last week, would be Gray County. I would also add to this list last week, um, voted to adjust their farm tax ratio downward as well. So other notable counties, Oxford, Dufferin, Elgin, uh, Brant, uh, Lambton, um, Chatham, Kent, and a number of single-tier municipalities, many in urban-related areas that have a significant amount of farmland. So you're looking at your, uh, you know, Kingston, City of London, City of Hamilton, City of Ottawa, all of which have expanded their borders to include a significant amount of rural area as well. Um, so what exactly, you know, is that number that we uh, uh, are requesting here today? Uh, again, we're in the third year of this assessment cycle. So uh, acknowledging that, you know, from 2012 to 2018, there has been uh, um, already a shift in tax, and, and really that's kind of already been eaten, right? So we've already, the farmers in, in the county have already eaten that increase. The request here today is just to prevent further increase in the tax burden. And I do want to reiterate that it's not, uh, the two things, that it's not going to mean farmers this year are paying less tax than they did last year. It would just mean that they would, all, they would pay basically the same proportion. So if, you know, think of your total taxes you collected as a tax pie, the farmer's slice of the pie would be the same this year as it was last year, recognizing that the pie itself needs to get bigger because, you know, for inflation and other priorities, you need to increase your budget each year. So the, the ratio that we would request uh, to, to maintain that um, um, slice of the tax pie as it was in 2018, which is already the, the largest it has ever been for farm properties in the county, would be uh, zero, adjusting down from 0 0.25 to 0 0.234. And for informational purposes, I, I have there what would be required in 2020 to do the same. But again, all we can ask is to uh, focus on 2019. That is all, um, you know, you can only do one year at a time. So um, that, yeah, request would be a ratio of 0 0.234 uh, for the 2019 tax year. So I uh, thank you for the time, and I'm very happy to, for questions and comments and discussion. Councilor Shurton. 
Uh, a couple things. Nice presentation uh, here today, Ben. Backing up when you mentioned about you've had some, uh, yeah, that's one here. This one, yep. Yeah. The other uh, delegation we had, they wanted to compare to Norfolk. How did you make out at Norfolk? Uh, we did make a delegation in Norfolk. I have not heard one way or the other if they have locked in their tax ratio policy. Uh, I went on their um, county website last week. I wasn't able to find the information, so I'm not 100% sure about Norfolk. Sure. And, you know, and one thing, um, I grew up in the farming background, still kind of consider myself a rural resident. But w what hasn't been mentioned here today, farmland in about 2000 was worth about 2,500 an acre. Today it's probably worth about 10,000 and higher. So that's the reality of why the taxes have gone up because the value of the land's gone up. Like, it's simple math. Yes. So the biggest challenge, I think, as a council that we have here is such a burden of our tax class is already residential. We seen a, we had a presentation earlier today that ideally it's nice to have about 20% commercial. Mm -hmm. Haldeman has about 4%. So that's where the challenge is. Uh, it'll be curious to hear other comments of council, but that's our biggest challenge is that our residential sector already eats so much of the taxes that we pay. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd like to see what we can do, but it'll be interesting to hear what other councillors have to say. Councilor Corbett. Thank you very much. I uh, very much appreciate the economic benefit to our county. I realize the farming is the number one employer. I'm trying to get a handle on what is saying here. You're comparing uh, the burden and I, are we comparing apples to apples? I don't really understand sure. that. How can I compare that? Yep. The only thing that comes to my mind is right now we give you 75%. Your taxes are uh, subsidized to 75%. How that reflects in the other. I know we just had the previous presentation which says the uh, farm development charges. You don't have one. Are the taxes you pay uh, a tax deduction for filing an income tax? Okay, so several things. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of take them one at a time uh, in order in which you ask them. So the first one here, so you had a question about comparing apples to apples for, for this graph here, is that right, of the, of the tax burden? Um, I would say yes, it's, this is apples for apples because this is a Haldeman, Haldeman County specific numbers, right? And this is showing from the last 20 years how much of your total budget uh, was or your total tax levy was collected from farm properties. So, if I may, I'll have to get that figure from from uh, Mark or sure. Charmaine. And and these are all taken from your financial information yeah. returns. My yeah. understanding is you got various areas with different amounts of farmland on. You got more farmland. They're going to have more assessment, and I don't fully understand that. I want that type of information with regard to the taxes. Right. Can you deduct the taxes you pay? Yes, as a business, uh, property tax is a deductible ex uh, well, expense. Are these other areas that have amended their, uh, their burden Oop, percentage, what did their residential taxpayers uh, say about that? Because if you shift that burden, somebody else has to pay it. And how do I go back with both my rural and uh, urban <coughs> taxpayers say as your residence is going up to compensate for that what is their responses to it because in some cases i see my assessment go up 17 percent mm -hmm. so i'm wondering what are we saying that sure. they're they're saying out there yeah what so are the residentials people are saying because they have to foot the bill well so i i suppose that's the way you look at it because really what we're asking here is to Farm has been footing more and more of, of the bill the last several years as the assessments have gone up. Uh, so in 2018, like I said, you've, you've collected a higher proportion from farm than you ever have before. So since 2012, residents have, this is a zero sum game. Um, you know, the amount of you collect from each property class has to add up to 100% uh, when you add up all the property classes. And as you've collected more and more from farm properties, that is at the benefit of, of the, all the other property uh, classes, commercial, industrial, um, residential. So what we're asking here today is in 2018, you've collected significantly higher you know, proportion of the total taxes from farm than you ever have in the past. 
we're asking to keep it at that rate. So the impact on residential is going to be very minor. You'd be looking at much less than a half a percent of, of increase in residential tax. In fact, if we look at the, the middle graph here, what we're asking is, is instead of going to 4.7 percent of the total taxes, remaining around 0. 4% of the total taxes. So what we're asking then is rather than taking that one-third of 1% and adding it all onto farmland, you distribute that one-third of 1% throughout all the property classes. So that is kind of your ceiling, 0.3% as an impact. And I'm looking for those numbers from uh, Mark and Charmaine. The further question I have with regard to the province's input in this. Now, when I started out and did some hobby farming, I got a rebate from the province. It shifted over to the municipality. Is the province putting in their full share for this? I don't know if there's any reconciliation on how much they're supposed to put forward to help out and what we're doing now. We're giving you 75% subsidy. So I'm well, trying to reconcile. A, a, another thing that I, I would say is definitely more less than open for interpretation. So property taxes, you collect property taxes to deliver services to properties in your county, folks in your county. Um, just because the rate of taxation on a particular property class is different than another property class does not mean that you are subsidized in that property class. If you look at, there's two sides of that ledger. One is what's coming in, and the other is what is that um, property demanding and services from you. Uh, there have been a number of studies on this particular issue, one done in Elgin County um, that shows Essentially, employment lands, farm, commercial, industrial, all bring in more revenue to their municipalities than are demanding in services. So the subsidy issue, uh, certainly an issue that can be debated. Um, I, you're referring back to the farm tax rebate program, switching over to the farm tax ratio. And actually, that was done at the same time as uh, basically property tax reform throughout the province. So a number of things changed, including the introduction of MPAC at that time, moving to more current value assessments for your property tax purposes, and including a shifting up and down in terms of what the services provided by municipality and what the province pays for. And at that time as well was introduced the Municipal Partnership Fund. Uh, now in recent years that has been reduced and that has been uh, an issue that we have lobbied with our rural municipalities on ensuring that the OMPF, which is you know the largest stable funding source from the province for many rural municipalities, that that needs to be increased and back to a level that is you know adequate for to uh, you know lessen the property tax burden on all property owners, uh, farm, residential, business, in rural Ontario, and that is up for review this year. Um, and as uh, having sat in the provincial budget lockup last week. That is something I firmly believe we will have to work together not only to increase but to maintain what we have uh, in that $505 million that goes to rural municipalities. That is something that the province may look at as something easier to balance their budget. Um, so it is something that we will need, and it's up for review, we will need to work together on. And we've, our position has been that it needs to, the cuts that were done to it four or five years ago, they cut out $100 plus million plus worth of that funding, needs to be restored and ideally indexed back to inflation of what it should have been by now. Thank you. I just see it as another downloading from the province for us to put on the local taxpayers, but I'm, I'm looking forward to what comes out of the information from staff because I know in previous times that burden shifts and it shifts to somebody else to pay, and there are, some of them are in, are in more dire straits than what you are, all right? I get the push from everybody. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions for Ben? No. Yeah, I just I did quick math, and I, I think we're going to certainly request some, you know, get some information. I sure. think as as we move through this, but you know, the quick math is is that what you're asking is is to 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 redirect about one and a half percent onto the residential tax base, and and so you know that that doesn't come without some thought and certainly some consideration. It's a pretty pretty lofty amount, although it doesn't sound like a lot. Uh, it, it is a lot, and, and, and not dismissing what's happened out here in our, our agricultural um, community, you know, certainly the residential uh, tax base has been hit uh, in an equal fashion uh, with respect to growth and marketplace, and yeah, they've had their 
assessed properties go up and they've benefited as a result of that but so of our farmers have benefited some of that so it's it's I think for us it's balancing that uh, it's not to suggest that uh, the information you bring is, is 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 not a fair argument it's how do we find that again solution that I think can meet meet the needs of the public and and ensure that you know the councillors can stand in a room whether it's in Selkirk or whether it's in Dunville that uh, that uh, you know they're not going to be walking out like our friend Gary Scanlon with a broken <laughs> broken ankle. So I'm being facetious, but I I, I, I just as I, I think that you know when we have to 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 simply take away from not just the percents because the percents are somewhat arguable. It's it's what's the real dollar, dollar value that we're asking of our our ratepayers and and as mentioned, our biggest challenge is 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 the fact that we can't displace more on our industrial or commercial base which is where we're seriously lacking and and have if we had a lot more depth in those particular categories then these kinds of conversations certainly would be a lot easier for us to to, to look at sure yeah absolutely and certainly i yeah i wouldn't uh, want you to make a decision before you have your staff look at the uh, impacts absolutely so while, while you're weighing the 1.1 percent potential impact on on residential i would add that farmers would be doing backflips for a 1.1 percent increase in their property tax uh it's much more closer to double digit percent increase year over year right so uh when you're looking at that 1.1 percent i i would only ask that you two <clears> things <throat> that you compare it against the the, the impact of not playing, doing it and playing. then looking back to, to 2012 yeah because that's when we see this graph really start to take off but you're playing percent <clears throat> games with me again and i can tell well, you that's that what the ratio one, controls i understand but one, <laughs> dollar my, my 1.1 yeah. percent on, on my residential home is still relative when i when we sit here and brag about uh, an operating budget that's that's two percent increase. We 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 respect, I guess, and understand that that's multiplied against the market assessed value and the growth. So so what happens is, of course, with many people in their in in their yeah, residential neighborhoods, they're getting hit with a four, five, six, and sometimes ten percent increase too because they've seen that increase in property values. So yeah. so I, I, I you know it's a percentage games yep. really get tough. I think for us, it's it's. And Mark's going to be tasked with the job to be able to come back to us and say, this is the dollars that, that you're asking, because those dollars don't go away. They just get pushed to some other class. Sure. Yeah. And then, so thank you. And um, I guess the, the very final thing about when you're looking at the dollars, right, you're looking at the dollar per, per household, uh, because again, that 1.1% gets stretched around through all the properties. And as you have more properties developed in the county, that lessens the impact on the kind of average or typical uh, property tax owner. So if you had a 2% increase in the number of residents, we're looking at a 1% uh, increase in tax for residents. Uh, the kind of looking at the average residential, the dollar impact is, is some of that gets absorbed by development, which again, draws them back to the point of we can't build more farmland. So we, we don't, they don't have the luxury of kind of spreading on new acres of farmland. Um, but uh, yeah, absolutely. I you heard it. our challenges with development developers over here on the other side of the table. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, no, I, I, yeah, no, I, I no hear, perfect solution. <laughs> I, I, I do hear what you're saying, and I, I guess it's it's our residential tax base as it stands today, uh, in terms of the provincial average, uh, is about 13 percent higher in terms of sharing the burden. We're, we're, our residential class is paying 77 percent of the tax base. And the provincial average is sitting around 65, 64 percent. And so, you know, whether we give them one percent, two percent, or not, it, they're already, from what their perspective, would sit in the <clears throat> same gallery and say, "We're paying more than our fair share." Sure. And yeah. so that's that balancing act. Absolutely. And on the issue of the balancing, uh, another thing I would. Uh, potentially recommend when you're looking at the numbers. We have our request here, but as I mentioned, you can set it to oh, anything yeah. you want. Yep. Maybe look at a few ratios. If there is something that maybe is not fully what we've requested, but is palatable on that balancing act, I, I do think there there is a mathematical uh, yep. solution there. But thank you so much for the uh, opportunity. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. Uh, thank you. So thank I you. need a mover and a seconder that correspondence material from Ben LaFort, senior farm, an farm, farm policy analyst. Uh, <clears throat> oh, you had Haldeman County, Ontario Federation. Sorry for that. So you're not just working for Haldeman County, you work oh, for the I whole province. The county, <laughs> okay. <laughs> the Ontario Federation of Agriculture, where you request to adjust tax ratio policy be received as information. Councillor Shurton. 
Seconded Councillor Medcalf. And I would just like to add to that, um, if, if I can, and I don't know if you can help me, but I'd just like to add to that, that if Mark, maybe you can provide us with some information relative, with respect to numbers uh, that help us and help council to, to take the information that's being presented in terms of the ask and, and, and what that translates into dollars, yeah. uh, dollars and numbers for the residential tax base. In three years, we've been, we would do that as part of the yeah. uh, tax policy report. So I did want to take the opportunity while the delegation is still here is that we would set the tax ratios as part of our tax policy report, which typically comes uh, late May, uh, early June. Okay. And so that's when we'd actually set our tax rates and included in that uh, policy will be the dollar analysis, you know, recognizing, you know, council has already seen the assessment shift report that came in February and I have shared that with the delegate recognizing there's already been a shift because of reassessment to residential I and mean, much larger than the shift that there was to uh, to farm in can, absolute dollars so i'll re include that with the can tax you, policy can you report. bring that forward to next next huh? count next week's council meeting uh Would that be th th three words but back. i can talked. share the dollars if you'd like yeah. to council before council if that's okay but the, yeah. like the actual setting of the tax ratios would happen with the tax policy report because okay. you have to look at all the tax policies in conjunction together correct okay good thank you Anything else for staff? No. Great. All those in favor? And that's carried unanimously. <coughs> and you, Ben, you have your information here left with us or staff? If you don't mind. And it, I'm going to ask you to give it maybe to Tyson and then he can pass it on to Mark. <laughs> Mark's a little dangerous in the corners. <laughs> Um, what's this now? Does anybody else want to Okay, speak? so I'm going to pass the floor to Tony because yep. I've just got to make a, uh, I've got Dave Montgomery waiting for me for a second, so okay. Okay, um, so, so members of council, there's been a request um, by a delegation here to speak on the uh, report that we're going to be dealing with on page 177 in regards to the, the potential sale of property near the Hagerstow Arena. So I have a motion oh, here. Um, is, isn't it open from that delegation to other people to speak or no? No, it's oh, okay. not. Okay. Why do we allow it in the farming, in the building one day? It well, was a public meeting. It's, that was a public was a meeting. Public this meeting. one isn't a public meeting. This is not a public meeting. Okay. Why don't we have the public meeting this morning then? That was a planning one. That was a planning oh. one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Who's on first? So, okay. so I'll explain <laughs> it to you afterwards. He's, he's gone from running the meeting. <laughs> so I have a motion here that reads that in accordance with section 19.3.5 of the procedural bylaw, Omar Oboya be permitted to appear as a delegation to speak to report LSS 12 2019, our unsolicited offer from 2589200 Ontario Incorporated, former rail line in Hagersall. I'll move it. Moved by Councillor Shirt and a second by Councillor Corbett. Maybe they can move out further. Yeah, I'll just hold on a second here. Let's deal with the motion first. All those in favor of the motion, it is carried unanimously. And there's correspondence here that uh, Jen is going to hand out to us. <coughs> so Omar, you can uh, come up to the podium here. You have 10 minutes to make your presentation, and then there could be then there could be questions from members of council. Hold on just a second, Omar, till everybody's got your presentation here. Thank you. Band's playing. Band's playing. <laughs> hey, go ahead, go ahead, Omar. Thank you, everyone, for the approving motion. Let me speak. I got a sore throat. I'll make it fast. I got to pick up my <coughs> kid from Hagersville School at 3 o'clock. Uh, I haven't had time. I saw the report last Thursday, so I haven't had time to prepare everything. And this is a passion project. Uh, I think the children in Haggers will need a place to be on Friday and Saturday for dancing and other activities. 
I haven't had the chance to address the stormwater management issue and the trail, etc., but I will. And uh, <clears throat> if you have any questions, please go ahead. Okay, uh, Councilor Sherton. So, just from reading this quickly, you, your plan is to develop a community uh, center for youth. Yes. Uh, uh, that's the plan? Yes. For children up to 12 and then up to 18 and then adults. So at 11 o'clock when the children ask, do you know where your parents are? Parents are next door. You know. yeah. I've seen a lot of kids smoking weed in that behind the uh, school, behind the hospital. Uh, this way, parents will know where the children are. They can drive them there. I've spoken with a few friends and uh, relatives over there and of my ex-wife and they all love the idea. Yes, yeah, so currently, just because I'm not as familiar with Hagersville and with other parts, th there's currently, there's nothing, no youth center, there's nothing um, there currently in Hagersville? Not that I know of. We have the arena, but yeah. no drop-in center or a proper place for children to get together. Sure, okay. In this way, all three ages will be side by side. And parents will not be inebriated because there'll be no alcohol in the adults area. Sure. Councilor Corbett? If I may, do you need all the property? And are you amenable to any rights of way to anybody to use the property? Yes, the right of way. Is, uh, I think they're doing a res residential development on 68 Main Street North, and they want to walk a path to the arena, which is perfectly OK and we'll create 150 parking spaces. And if it's necessary to make space for walking trail, I'll work something out over there. Thank you. Councillor Lawrence. Yep. Great idea there, Omar. Um, Thank you. Couple, couple questions here. Um, the building to house what you're proposing here, approximately um, square footage, how big would it be? And then also as far as uh, staffing it, would, would you be staffing it? Would uh, uh, would you be contracting it out? Uh, it will be contracted out. The con children's areas will be, and even in the adult area, there'll be teenagers who'll want to get jobs in there. Right. I've been in hospitality for 45 years, so I know a little bit about it, but there will be a manager. It won't be myself right. running it. Um, so, and, and how big's the building, do you, uh, roughly, do you? I'm estimating of? total about... Uh, Roughly about 30,000 square feet oh. we put together. But a lot of, almost all of it will depend on input from the children and adults of the uh, community. We can just decide, oh, I'll do this, we'll have an art show. They have to tell us what they want. Could I, for, furthermore, um, how, like, like it's fantastic, how, how will it pay for itself? Like is there I'll be paying for the construction and the cost. And the cost of the children will be nominal. Right. Adults will be five dollars each. This is a project passion project. It's not for getting rich. Okay. <coughs> so Omar, you're not, you're not here today then asking the municipality for any financial contribution towards the construction or the operation of, of such a facility. You're saying you're going to cover that yourself. You're, you're simply here asking about the property itself. The you, property itself. Okay. Okay. But if you would like to participate. <laughs> <laughs> Sandra, thank you. This are, there, are, there, are there any other questions from members of council? Councilor Patterson. I guess not a question, just a statement. And I can't tell what my fellow councillors will vote on this, but basically the staff recommendation, due to the location, they're not advising approval of this. Mm. So what I'm wondering is an awesome idea. We need more of this in our communities. I don't know what the appropriate thing would be. I hate, I hate to see a vote on this and it gets to feed it. Um, what's your opinion on if we say to fair something like this that you can have a chance to sit down with staff to find perhaps a better location? Certainly. I just, I just hate to see it kicked to the curb due to a technical No, wherever we can do it. I have a nine and a half year old boy and I'm worried about his future because I don't see anything over there. And Omar, just so you know that we're accepting your presentation here now, but we, we will be going in camera because we have some information from staff that, mm -hmm. that they want to present to us and we'll be having the discussion in camera 
and council will make the decision as to what it is we're, we're going to do. So staff sure. will get back to you and let you know that. Um, Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions, Mr. Oboya? No, I guess not, Omar. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much for your time, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. So a motion here, <coughs> um, the correspondence from Omar Oboya, Wild Rose Developments. We report LSS 12, 2019, unsolicited offer from 2589200 Ontario Incorporated. Former rail line in Hagers will be received as information. I have a mover and seconder. Councillor Patterson, Councillor Corbett. All those in favor of the motion, it is carried unanimously. Excuse me. Okay, so back to uh, our agenda. Remember where we left off here. Okay. So we'll move on to item number I, which is the minutes from the Police Services Board meeting on February 27th. And kind of a mover and seconder to get that motion of Councillor Corbett. And the seconder, Councillor Metcalf. Just to speak on it, Mr. Chairman, if I can. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been almost four months into our uh, meeting schedule and uh, we have yet to receive two provincial appointees on that committee. I don't know what's holding it up. I, I don't know whether they have to address the various uh, people that they have to bring forward. But uh, I'm sure we're not the only one and, and it's helpful if we have more people there to... We can handle it, I'm not saying that. <laughs> Any, com any other comments or questions in regards to the Police Services Board minutes? Just another comment. I think we've uh, uh, just received another report of a speed spied cam, and I can tell you uh, indi the indications, although people are complaining, there's less than 4% uh, are speeding over 20% or 20 kilometers an hour. and. Uh, the thing you have to look at when there's police deployment is that you don't send people out unless there's a hot spot. And I, I, I can tell you, we, we are addressing hot spots. But when people complain about it, and yes, in one case, I think there was somebody going 147 kilometers an hour, it's certainly not acceptable. But we're not going to have a police officer. I don't see the uh, reality of having a police officer sit there day in, day out for one person. Okay, the motion's been tabled. All those in favor? It is carried unanimously. Unfinished business. Go ahead, Jim. So just some comments about uh, the unfinished business items. Uh, these were brought, there were two resolutions here brought forward from the last council meeting per Councillor Corbett's request. Um, if council agrees with them in principle today, uh, we suggest that they be, ferred, be deferred to next Tuesday's council meeting and that'll give staff some time to kind of massage them and tailor them to fit Haldeman County. Councillor Corbett. Yeah. That's quite a process to go through just to agree with what they're doing. Like this one of uh, soggy shores, it speaks to recreational things and the province kicking in the money and the federal government kicking in the money that they should for these types of things. And similarly with bottled water, and you can see out there what a mess it's causing with regard to all these plastics out there. So the process is we come back to council again and a motion is made at council and you'll have an appropriate motion for them? Yes, next Tuesday we'll bring them forward and we'll have tailored them to fit Haldeman County. Thank you. Yes, do we have a motion to receive that? That's just a deferment. Okay, so we're on new business here. We have a motion here regarding items one and two that consideration of the resolutions from the town of Soggy Shores the city of Quinty West be deferred to the April 23rd council meeting to permit a review by staff. Mover and seconder, Councillor Corbett and Councillor uh, 
works. All those in favor? Is carried unanimously. <laughs> Item L, any inquiry is announcements or concerns of members of council? Councilor Lawrence. Uh, yeah, just an announcement uh, reminder that on April 27th is the dedication grand opening, if you want to call it, for the two uh, trails uh, here in Cuga, the Grand Vista Trail 1030 is the time it commences, and then the Gypsum um, Trail in Caledonia at one o'clock the same day. And hopefully that uh, anybody will, hopefully will have a decent turnout. Hopefully Mother Nature will be a nice lady and cooperate, give us some nice sunshine. Back on her well. What are you doing that day? Nice <laughs> 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 watch, by the way. Oh, okay, thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Any other inquiries, announcements, Councillor Metcalf? Just an announcement. On that same day, the Selkirk Fire Department is running their uh, annual uh, spring fish fry that day on the 27th, I believe. And uh, also, I'd like to make an announcement of uh, no our Haldeman juveniles that play out of Cayuga uh, did wind up losing in the sixth game in overtime to Honeywood um, in their OMHA uh, bid for championship they lost in the finals of course but they uh they really represented the whole the county and Cayuga very well throughout the playoffs and commendable for the coaching staff and the players so thank you Councilor Patterson <clears throat> yeah I'd just like to bring it to everybody's attention that finally Councilor Metcalf knows which ward he represents since the last announcement I had it let people know in ward two that the fish rule show was happening and I was about to tell him about the Selkirk fish fry, but I guess I don't have to now. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> Any other announcements? Oh. Council, I guess, well, it reminds me. <laughs> well, absolutely. Now you got talking hockey. So um, the Haldeman River Cats, the, um, we had the three teams go to the OW Provincials. And unfortunately, we didn't come away with a medal, but our double Bs did finish fourth. Uh, midget double Bs finished fourth out of 24. They uh, came back and uh, they won their division. Uh, went into directly the quarterfinals on the Saturday night. We're down three nothing to Woodstock with about a minute left in the second. Uh, came back and tied it up with less than a minute left and won it in overtime. And then went into Sunday morning. We went into 0-0 tie into the fifth overtime against Lake, uh, Lake Shore which is down near Windsor. And unfortunately, the referee called a Don Cherry penalty on us. Uh, too many women on the ice. We'll blame it on one of the coaches. And unfortunately, they scored and put us into the bronze medal, which we unfortunately lost North Bay. But uh, the young ladies from Haldeman, and as I said before, all three teams, well, the whole organization's represented from all four corners of the county very well. In fact, Councillor Corbett, it's your nieces on one of the teams as well. And uh, Councillor Sheridan was our former ice scheduler. Her daughter played for us as well. And actually, our mayor was the original founder. So um, Council Chambers uh, is well represented with the Haldeman River Cats. But uh, the girls were great. So That's great. Thank you. So we'll move on to um, item number M, which is our closed session. <coughs> and uh, I have a motion here. It reads that to pursuant to Section 239 of the Municipal Act as amended, Council convened a meeting at uh, 2.48 p.m. Close to the public to discuss a proposed or pending acquisition or dispo disposition of land by the municipality or local board. ENG 03 2019 regarding the Argyle Haddington property purchase upset limit revision. LSS M07 2019 additional information related to the LSS 12 2019 unsolicited offer from 258-9200 Ontario Inc former rail line at Hagersill and labor relations or employee negotiations regarding HRD 05 2019 SEIU CA ratification. All those in favor of this motion, or sorry, a mover and seconder for this motion. Councillor Patterson and Councillor Metcalf. Well, we can agree on something. <laughs> All those in favor? All those in favor. After we 